Welcome to Biggest Geekus. We're your hosts. I'm Randy. And I'm Joe. This is episode 40 of our podcast, and the date is Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. One day early. Yeah, a little bit early this week. I'm, uh, I'm Ashley Play tomorrow night. Little Bobby. You cheating? Are you cheating? I'm cheating on him. Yes. Oh, my word. 100%. I don't so, know how to handle that. Well, come to grips, man. <laughs> Yeah, so anywho, how's it been, man? Well, it hasn't been that long since I've seen you, but how, how has this week been hard after your long weekend off with a tough getting back and having to work? It's been really humid. I don't know if you can tell on the video. I've got all kinds of, I broke out all along the edge of where I have my hat when I'm outside, you know, um, heat bumps. Yep. I don't have heat bumps, but I got sunburn. I biked about 20 miles this morning and 150 push-ups. Oh, dang all at one time oh no heck no <laughs> that'd be insane 30 30 and a pop roughly 30 pop yeah i was tired really tired not great push-ups i mean i was i was up on my toes and i was going down pretty pretty low but you know big fat dude it's kind of hard so right right i was sweating and i was beat i was drained so yeah i had a good good workout yeah i had a good workout i was out in the humidity getting squeezed i bet all day through. Yeah. All right. We got a little call in action. Yes. You know what? I have to, once again, I forgot that um, Anchor's stupid interface. Yes. Doesn't tell me dates. Oh, I had some issues trying to get a hold of Big John and Red Dice listened to their podcast on the Quartermaster, which is very good. And uh, I, uh, trouble with SpeakPipe. I don't know what the deal is. So yeah. I Go ahead. I said I actually left messages on the internet. I just went to their anchor website, found it much easier, and actually went to John's webpage and just left a message there. I think you can do a minute and a half on his thing. Yes. Which is cool. Yes, yes. So I found but I, I what I need to find out. It looks like we have um, three people that called in. So that's great. Excellent. Let's make sure I can hear them, bud. No. We don't want Come that. Come on. We don't want that. I want to hear. Play it for me. All right. Let's start it. Hello. My name is Taylor, and I'm a gatekeeper. More seriously, Whenever the subject of gatekeeping arises, I like to tell a story about a friend of mine who was on vacation in a foreign town. Bar hopping in the evening for fun, they came across a particularly lively establishment but were, were accosted by the bouncer. He simply said, do you two like chicks? When they said yes, he said, then you guys aren't going to want to be here. So what had happened, they had mistakenly wandered into the gay district of that downtown scene. They said, thanks, turned around, and went to a different establishment. There was no judgment. The bartender did not care that they were straight, and my friends did not care that the occupants of the club were gay. They just realized that wasn't the club for them. Uh, yeah, simple enough. Yeah. So, with that context in mind, Oxford English Dictionary defines gatekeeping as controlling access to an area or resource. Do I control access to my game? Yes, I do. But I do it as a service to the players. I know that I run an old school game. I know that I run high lethality and focus on the treasure. And I want to make that evident to people who are joining our table. I recognize, like the uh, one nightclub versus another, each game table is going to be different and it's going to cater to a different style of play. By being forthright with new players about how my table works, I prevent them from wasting an evening on something that they don't enjoy and I protect my players from people coming in with different expectations who might mess up the already established rhythm. You know, I had a comment on that. I agree with Taylor. I wish I was better at, I wish I had been better in the past 
at communicating those things. Uh, luckily, I've been with friends grown with me, you and several others. We've grown as players together. I don't mean like we're somehow, we're now so mature as gamers. Just we've, we've learned together and things have gone up and down and good and bad times. But I think it's interesting that he would say that. If you can communicate, sometimes I wonder, I think I have a better handle now on how I like to play. That's a good point. You really should new players say, here's how we normally roll and just make it really clear. I think it's hard though, when you first meet somebody, if you like somebody nice enough, say to invite them to your house, if you like them well enough, I should say, and you're getting along, you know, personally, and then gaming comes up, then you invite them to play. That's a, you know, you gotta, you may, might be hesitant to say too much. I don't know. It just seems like I can never think of how to describe it. If they're a gamer, how I would tell them, this is what my game is like. How would you do it? I, I know. I, I was just thinking the same, same or similar, something similar. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you'd have to keep it simple and probably use the most uh, broad sweeping terms so that you weren't, you know, spending a whole lot of time on it, but that you were hitting the highlights like uh, OSR, uh, yeah. we're old school. Uh, we like to do a lot of combat or maybe we if you, that's not it, maybe it's, we do a lot of role playing here. We don't focus on the combat too much. You know, there's probably a, a, like a, a elevator pitch is what they call it. Your best uh, minute on how you sell your game. And, and it may about. not, it may not uh, work. You might tell them that and they're like, all right. And then you play and they're like, okay, that's not what you said, but correct. Uh, or, or <laughs> right. I mean, they'll, they might think that. And sometimes people fill in gaps with their own expectations, even though you've said the right words. Yeah. So you can do your best and, you know, whatever happens. Uh, if you're all adults, it shouldn't really matter a whole lot. No. Um, if it doesn't, if it does, if the, the gameplay at the table doesn't suit you, you could just sit and say, you know, this isn't for me. No offense to anybody. Or you yeah. can sit there and play the rest of the evening out and then, uh, just say, you know, uh, I'll find a different group or whatever. Yeah. But uh, as long as everybody's going to be adults about it and not have a breakdown at the table, right? no matter which side of the equation you're on, right? Um, then it shouldn't matter a whole lot what you say precisely, as long as you're trying your best. I wonder if Taylor's had those issues where there was a miscommunication. Someone didn't understand what he meant, or maybe he didn't say what he meant exactly. I bet that's probably happened. It's possible. And, uh, you know, we're in a pretty cool situation where we can draw a lot of people that, that we know. We all know each other's play styles, and we know mm -hmm. who fits good and who's not going to care one way mm -hmm. or the other. And uh, we don't have the problems that maybe some other folks do. They mm -hmm. might have to go to a, a, a game store or play online a lot at this point and online, you never know who you got coming. If you, you know? do the whole crap shoot thing, unless you have yeah. you and four of the people show up every week. Sure. You sure. Show and play. But if you, yeah, not or convention plays can be a pain, yep. but uh, as far as that goes, as far as I know, I, I, you know, I don't know about that. I don't, yeah, I've never gone to out. a convention. Yeah. Yeah. But I have done some game store play where you're like, Oh boy, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, we got one more. To be clear, I have never kicked someone from my table for anything other than their impact on the table. I have kicked players who were disruptive. I have had players leave who were not interested in the style of play. However, I have played with the whole spectrum of ethnicity, I have played with the whole spectrum of sexuality, and I've had transgender individuals play at my table also. The point is, we had a shared love of the game. We had a shared love of the adventure. And at the end of the day, that's what gaming is about. So gatekeeping, I think you are right that the term has been co-opted by people who want to control how you do your game. And that's ironic. It's a projection. The people who want you to change are the ones using your control as ammunition. Just my two cents.
I agree. I think that's something oh. we brought up in, in our in our uh, ranty rant last uh, week. But okay. thank you very much, Taylor. Yeah, your, your uh, two cents are uh, well taken and no change. We're going to keep that. Keep thank it. You. Yep. Hey, guys, Jason here. So I guess we'll start from the back and come forward. Gatekeeping. I do not disagree with you. It definitely happens, but it's not a great word for it. And if we fix it by just calling the people jerks like they are, that works for me. It really does. As far as the main body of your show, talking about downsizing your collection all that, oh yeah, if, if you have the space to keep it and you've got a contingency for what's going to happen to it when you're gone, then it's all good. Especially if you have a local group or something, you know, it's like, hey honey, if anything ever happens to me, just call Randy and Joe and they'll come get all my books and, you know, take them to the cabin. And, and that's cool. I, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, like in my case, I, I mean, some of it I can give to my son, but, you know, he's not interested in all of it. Hey, you put it on tape. When you mm-hmm. go, it's Randy and Joe who get that's your right. stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. We got the internet as our witnesses. <laughs> cool. <Hey. laughs> that's probably failing on my part that he's not interested in all my games. I should probably um, work on that. But, no, for the most part, I'm with you. I'm going to do another segment on my show, too, on this. Although I think we've kind of hit the big part. Obviously, PDS you don't have to worry about. But if if you are going to scale back, what does that look, you know, what could it look like potentially? And it's more of a more of a what if, right? You know, the Marvel Comics, what if, or a DC, or the Elseworlds. You know, just a, a thought experiment. You know, if I did pare back, what would it look like? I mean, there are definitely things. If there are games that you haven't touched for years and you don't enjoy, you know, you don't pull them out every now and then and read them and you don't think you're ever going to play them, then really you might as well sell them and get the money for it and spend that money on something you are going to enjoy. But there are some games that I'm never going to play that I do enjoy reading and looking at, so I, I just enjoy owning them. I wouldn't worry too too awfully much about what your uh, whether your son likes exactly precisely all the things you do, uh, so expose him to the to the different game systems that you have, which you have a ton. From yeah, I mean, just from hearing the little bit of your podcast that I have, you yeah. seem to have tons. And, yeah, and over time he'll develop his own tastes, and it'll probably it will probably be similar. As, probably. As, Chances are good. I mean, like my daughter, she's uh, I had her play D and D when she was young. She played a little bit with her husband. She likes it, but I wouldn't call her by any stretch of the imagination. She doesn't care about how. I mean, I don't think she cares about collecting books or anything. So. Right. Yeah. Anyhow, I just figured I'd let you down last time by not calling in, so I better give you a call this time. Hope you guys are all doing well. Hope your family's doing well, and I will talk to you next time. Take care. That's good, Jason. You, you've earned lots of credit, dude. It's okay. You take a little time off. Um, <laughs> you think uh, it's interesting, though, uh, Jason's going to do downsizing. It's funny because I'll tell you, Jason, I stole the idea from you. <laughs> you. You mentioned on your podcast a while back, and I was like, that's a great idea. <laughs> so we got to it first, though. It's ours. No, I doubt it. <laughs> I know. I heard on Gaming and BS a couple years ago, so. We weren't first, probably the best, but not first. Well, it's an idea that you've been kicking around yeah, off and yeah. on for years. Yeah. Because you have a lot. And I do the opposite of downsizing. So and, talk and, about it. I don't do it. And the other thing is having a lot of stuff does introduce stress just by having it. Yeah, just stuff. Yeah. Just having stuff. Yeah. Uh if you have it well organized, it's less stressful. And if it's not in your way, it's less stressful. But you still have to manage it, oh, which is yeah. stressful. Not Starting a with, huge degree, but some. Starting with college, when I, when I moved to IU from a small town in Indiana, you know, I went to a local camp, college, um, regional satellite campus for a couple of years. Then I moved to Bloomington, and I thought, I got to take my comics with me. So I loved them. 
And I did that for many years. Went to grad school and I got married and I lugged them. I lugged them, changed apartments, did this, you know, got divorced and I lugged them. Got a new place and I lugged them. Got married again and I lugged them. I mean, after a and while. You know, you know, you never picked up on the uh, the fact that there is a, such a thing called storage. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. There's been, uh, you could have had like a, and you have used them. Yes. Uh, a storage, a storage uh, unit. Unit. Uh, I'm pretty sure they had them when we were at college age. Yeah, they probably but weren't. They probably weren't cost effective at that point. And I'd be loath to. Um, I've used them a couple times in my life. I'd be loath to put my comics on a storage unit. Yeah, because you, there's, <laughs> unless you have one that is uh, temperature uh, controlled, temperature controlled, and moisture controlled, and all that stuff, which is yeah. probably expensive. Yeah. Oh, speaking of that, before we move on. Uh, no, I'll make. I'll try to comment. No, I'm gonna do it now. I'm talking about comics. Um, my local comic store guy, he told me there's something called the Promise Collection that was recently discovered. It's a really cool story. I'm gonna mention it. I you know. I'll, I'll mention the Promise Collection in the positive material plane. Go ahead. Okay. Randy and Joe, it's Andy Goodman, your favorite number one fan. <laughs> So, point of uh, point of uh, order, noisome, noisome. Where did I work, Where did I learn the word noisome? Noisome is not a British word. I mean, it's an English word. I learnt it from Gary Gygax. Gary Gygax oh. uses it at least a few times in uh, the first edition DM's Guide and Monster Manual. Possibly. Otiuch, or whatever, however you pronounce it. Who knows? I don't know. No, not, no, I don't think it's used in those monster descriptions, but he definitely uses it a lot. And I had to, of course, look it up when I first read it because it sounds like it's something to do with noise, but it's nothing to do with noise. It's to do with smell, as you pointed out. Yes. Good word. Good word. I'll think of more words. I wonder <laughs> if it has, if since it has something to do with smell. Mm hmm. If it, because it's noisome, which is weird. Yes, it's possible that its origin is uh, have to has to do with flatulence. Well, I just googled it real quick and it does say. And by the way, Andy, thanks for thanks for learning us something. I do appreciate that. Uh, because literary adjective having an extremely offensive smell, noisome vapors from the smoldering waste, and then also disagreeable or unpleasant. So I guess it doesn't have to be fully just smelly. But that's, right, of course, right. a quick. That's Oxford. Hey, wait a minute now. English Oxford is weird. Dictionary. Oxford. But he's, he said he, he didn't pick the word out. So, okay. I know, a, it's, you know, there is an American Oxford University. Yeah, that's true. And Gar if Gary Gagax said it, then we probably are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. That's cool. Now, there was me listening or about to listen to your negative material plane and getting ready to uh, shake my fist at the cloud at your intransigence. There we go. Another big word um, at your, <laughs> at your in intolerance, intolerance at your um, fecundity. No, that's wrong. Anyway, um, uh, and here's the shock. I agreed with you about Ravenloft. I agreed with you. It should be there. It should be. You should be murdering players in Ravenloft. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And this whole power trip, yeah, totally doesn't work. Totally doesn't work with the Ravenloft setting. Um, having said that, I did play as a player in Curse of Strahd and I enjoyed it. But the whole idea of having a horror setting per se in a fantasy superhero game... Ah, you're right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does you know not. What? Yeah, I think he's... Well, I, I had mentioned that because I'd heard him in one of his podcasts. I listened to Andy's this week. He had mentioned playing of that, and I left him a message. I don't know if I got sidetracked. I, I might have been biking when I did it, too, so hopefully you can understand it. But um, uh, he had mentioned playing in Curse of Strahd, and I was like, man, I wondered if he liked that. I really wanted to know. Um, intransigent, I just looked his word up, characterized by refusal to compromise. Um, or to abandon an often extreme position or attitude. Yeah, I think a lot of people can be that. It can be very hard once you once you commit to an idea. It takes a lot to sway, not just me, but a lot of people. It should. Some, 
and it probably should. You should be it very should. convinced. But yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad people you shouldn't just be led around by the nose. I got an idea. Oh, how do we go follow that? No, no. Yeah, but I, I think our our thoughts that Ravenloft is not really for superheroes, and same for you know Professor DM that said that it's it's right. I mean, you have to be. It's yeah. I mean, I don't think there's, it's hard to argue that it's really not gothic horror if you do it. So yeah. right. Um, yeah, and the whole idea of fear and everything. Uh, if your character can go and beat up all the monsters without a whole lot of uh, effort, um, expense, expenditure resources and all that, uh, how how is that dark? How is that terror? <laughs> how are you? How is that, how yeah, is it yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and having in with the D and D as the system, horror has to be low level. One, two, three. I think how so. much more than that? I know because I've never seen a version of D and D. Where you get past third or fourth level, you can even use. It's hard to scare the characters. They start getting magic items. Forget about it. I mean, you can just throw bigger monsters at them. Yeah, but that's not real. It's but then again, it's it's about adventure, and the, to me, D and D is about adventure, and um, not just adventure, but like kind of heroic. You know, the hero fighting great odds and well, dangerous and horror are two different things. Yeah, danger and horror. There you go. Danger that's and true. horror are two different things. Mm -hmm. And you know, this kid's glove business, not scaring the players. I mean, the question still remains, as one of you said, can you even, can you actually scare a player at a table? I've done a whole, I'm doing a whole series of episodes now about that on, on expedition to the Grizzly Peaks. <sighs> Probably not, but you want to unsettle them. I mean, you want to make them feel creeped out and, and, Th threatened I do think you can act as a character who's threatened without being threatened yourself so I'm not sure I agree with you on the make the character scared I think you can play it as if you're scared and and generate this horror but but Raven woke come on guys that is just lazy that's lazy it's it should be called Raven soft yeah yeah you like it? I do like Raven Soft, but Woke is soft. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, woke is weak sauce, dude. Yeah. And I know there's a big push now to say, oh, the new Woke is the anti-Woke. No, it's not. Woke is Woke. It's stupid. People are soft, making excuses for everything. But I get what Andy's saying. I like Raven Soft. That's a better sound. It flows more like Raven Loft. I do like that. Yeah. I think it's fitting, too, with the whole don't scare the players. Now, Oh, we didn't say There's a, no, no, no. That's, that's what, what they, says in the book. Yeah, that's what it says in the book. Yeah. You can scare the players. Yep. But to really scare them, you pre pretty much have to be a psychopath. Or like, like the one. Uh, there's a YouTube video where the dude puts out a live tarantula on his game table and surprises everybody. Oh my. Uh, yeah. Um, that's probably uh, deserving of a black eye or two. For some people in our group, it would. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that kind of um, actually doing something in the real world yeah. that truly scares the people at the table to where they are actually frightened, not just a shock thing, but actually right. frightened is probably abusive. So you yeah, don't, well, you don't I, even want to do that. No, but I, I think Andy's point of creeping people creeping out. Creeping people out you can do without. And, yeah, and you can do that. And I've done that not meaning to, even you, where you're like, oh my God, that's creepy. Yeah. You, know, you said that because the bad guy's doing something heinous. But I think Andy, Andy's right. I, as much as I'm still okay with the word woke, I do think Raven Soft rhymes with Raven Loft, and it's pretty spot on. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. And to be, I think if you're going to do, I wonder if you could adapt the. Uh, system that we used at Cabin Con. Uh, what's that called? Zero Engine or something like that? Zero oh, Day? Oh, you're talking about um, for Year aliens? Zero. The Aliens one, yeah. I think it's Year Zero Engine. Patrick would know more. Um, I wonder if you could adapt that into a Ravenloft. Absolutely. Setting. And Use you should. Setting. Yeah, that would be better. Sense. Yeah, because they have some... I mean, I'd want to modify... I'd, I would modify the panic rolls... Uh, especially some of the results, and it'd be probably best to make panic rolls that fit each adventure. Uh, but even generic ones could work. I do think that could be a that could be a really good system 
platform, dude. Especially as especially as deadly as Aliens Combat is, I think that would be a great horror system to use in a horror game. Yeah. I think that's really that's a good idea, Joe. That's cool. Yeah, shouldn't be too hard to adapt. No, no. If it's a it's a, a generic system, right? Yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't be too hard. Well, they have a couple of games use, that use that engine. I think. I think it's Forbidden Lands and a few others, and they're coming out with another one. So, I think it's the Year Zero. Patrick will call in and correct us if we're using the wrong one. So, anyway, that's cool. Thanks, Andy. And Jason. thanks to all of our callers. Yeah, Taylor, all you guys, awesome, good calls. All right. So on to the positive material plane. So I want to yes. talk about this. Just about this promise collection. It's not in the notes, but it just came to my mind. This is. A, I wish I might, hope I get the story right. Um, local comic store here in uh, my town. Guy yeah, told me to look it up. Sent me a link. It was really interesting. It was a story about a young man who collected comics. I want to say in the 30s or 40s. You you could even Google it right now if you wanted to, Joe. Yeah, um, the Heritage Auction. Yeah. Thing. Oh so, yeah, I mean he's got. But he had like, and he was going off to war and he asked his brother to keep it for him until he got back. And if something happened to keep track of him. And so, of course, he died in, in World War II. And then the brother went off to another war and he died or something happened to him and he died. And his children's, and there's children's children just found it. And it was in a house. And for some reason, it was all but hermetically sealed. I mean, it was in perfect conditions. And he had like, almost i think he might have had bags in them in bags and that was it oh. and so apparently i mean i don't know how much it's worth but he had a ridiculous run of golden age comics of oh, all wow. types, superheroes you know the early supermans the wonder womans all these things it was you know probably worth a couple million millions of dollars I'm sure a couple million bucks it says that, here five thousand golden age comics wow that's money mm. If you have a golden age comic who is like the cover is still on it, it's probably worth money. Oh, sure. And there's 5,000 if they wanted to sell them all. No, if he, if he sold, sold them all, yeah, they'd be like, uh, wow. Pretty, yeah, I mean, whether he has Action Comics 1 or Detective Comics 27 or any of the really big ones, he's just got a handful of the issues. I mean, if you have Superman 1 through, I don't know, 150, you got some pretty fine books. Detective Comics 140. Oh, nice. Captain America Mar Comics 74. Mm. Captain America's Weird Tales. I never even heard of that title. I don't know. Captain America's gone through some strange iterations, to my knowledge. Yeah. So anyway, that was that's just a cool it's a good story, too. Yeah. Really yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh at this point, you think that all this stuff, uh, finding these kinds of things, yeah, that everything should be found, you would think. Correct. But no, so there, there's no telling. There could be. I wonder if this could. There's five thousand of them. Yeah. I wonder if this that is could five thousand of the Golden Age comics. I wonder if that would drive the 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 prices of them down. Mm. Because there's more oh, of them. Rarity is a function of how many there are. You're talking pre World War II comics, though. Sure. A lot of those were uh, mulched during World War II, which is the real value, and that's why Ashen Comp may believe there's like six six complete copies of action comics one in existence right that, that have the cover and are, are decent and readable and then well, right. or maybe it's maybe yeah. it's near mint but still I get that i get yeah. that i'm just wondering if this isn't if this uh, this volume of comics from that age finding them i mean at some point if you found enough it should drive the prices down because yeah, it would you, change you, the rarity i agree but you need a lot more than five thousand. Oh, i mean just because there'd be collectors would snatch that up. I mean, they would buy all of them. I'll take every one of those at the price. Mm -hmm. Whatever whatever they grade out to be, they, they'd pay for it. Now, that would be a collection. I talked about once about grading out comics. Get a CGC grade, which is kind of past my... That was like a thing that happened. I didn't know about until I quit collecting. But they put them in these really hard sleeves. You've probably seen them. They're like hard plastic. And they grade them on a scale from, you know, zero to, you know, nine or ten gem mint. And... uh it costs about 30 bucks a book to do that. So that'd be a, that'd be $150,000 to grade all those books. And that would be worth every penny. I would literally go out and borrow the money to have them graded if I had to, because you would get that back with about two or three books. 
I mean, you would make a bundle. And I don't care. Even though what he's saying, I'm sure the ones he listed there are probably several tens of thousand dollar books each. If they're as good as shape as they talked about. So yeah, that's that's one of the more recent big finds. But I mean, I guess theoretically, you're right. You could find it if you had enough of these finds, but 5,000 books is not that many. I mean, it sounds like a lot to you. It's not a lot for a collection. I mean, I have about 8,000. Oh, so, okay. I mean, it's not... But it's but as far as valuable, I don't have it. I don't have a single book that's valuable as any of those. Guarantee. I mean, I would practically, I would almost guarantee it. Well, it says here that the detectives comics that they have, detective comics that they have, yeah, that listed here, number one forty, mm-hmm. is graded at nine point six. Wow. CGC pedigree grade. That is ridiculous, dude. That means it was kept in per in a perfect temperature for all those years pre World War II. That is unbelievable. Same That's thing. Smart. Looks like they have an. Well, this lady looks like an early version of Wonder Woman, Could but be. she's called Phantom Lady. And that's different. Yeah. And the name of the comic is Phantom Lady. Yeah. And also nine point six. Oh man. No one would, Yeah. No one would draw this lady like this right now. Yeah. She really bucks them. Yeah. Very yeah. feminine. Yeah. And um, the. Uh, oh, did you hear the news in the comics? Did you see Patrick's post? No, they're going to kill Doctor Strange. Of course they are, so that Good. they can. So that Captain, they Marvel, can... Captain Marvel is going to become uh, the next Sorcerer Supreme. Of course they are. They can't have think. a dude. They can't have no, a dude. <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't know the whole details, but yeah, that's pretty brilliant. So yeah, they can't oh, have oh, a dude. Hold on. They can't. They cannot. Okay, this is this would be negative positive. material. Positive, positive. Sorry. So anyway, very cool promise collection, and we played again. What about that? That's awesome. Two times fun. in a week. We haven't done that in forever. A Monday and a Friday. We played more Savage Worlds. This, you guys, is pretty fun. I like the, I like the adventure. It was fun. We had to push to get it done, but we did get it done. So that was cool. It was good. And then I went to a drive-in. You didn't. You should have joined us. It was fun time. Just being at the drive-in. It was cool. Yeah, that was that was not possible. Not in the cards, but not it was fun. Cards. Yeah. Another good positive thing is it, I've uh, created an. Uh, a channel for us on odyssey.com. Yes, you'd mention that. I better check that out. I put two, um, two, I put 10 episodes up there, though, the latest 10. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, Odyssey, for those who don't know, is a, uh, it's not really a YouTube competitor. It's more of, uh, I don't know, they would probably explain it better, but it's kind it's in the same market. They post videos and stuff, right? It's videos. But um, it's decentralized, so it's you. When you upload, it sends the video pieces out to different servers. So um, uh, I don't know exactly how to explain it without getting too in depth. But it's decentralized, okay. so you're not relying on a single company's server if you have content that they would be objectionable, object, 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 objectionable to. Okay. So, that, so, no, so they don't get to judge your content, whether it's right. Okay. Uh, so, of course, since it's a public company, mm-hmm. they do have to abide by certain laws. So okay. there's certain types of uh, imagery that they will not accept, but it's very limited to stuff that's illegal oh, in, in, okay. in the U.S. Gotcha. Okay. So they're U.S. kind. That's cool. Good yeah. deal. That's nice, man. Good job, Joe. So we have oh. another spot. Another comment positively, I don't know, it's dangerous. After the downsizing, our downsizing episode, guess what I did? You went and bought a bunch of stuff. <laughs> well, a few things. It's not a true. I, bought, I spent $13 and got like five, no, $25 so I can get the Amazon free shipping on five RPG products. One of them being basic role playing. Uh, the other is, um, what did I get? No, this is a drive through. I got Lion and Dragon RPG print. Oh, okay. Have um, you gotten it yet? Uh, nope. It's going to be three to four weeks, but I ordered it on because drive through takes a while. Yeah. And I ordered some things because, you know, they're going to be increasing their printing costs here soon. So I bought a couple of things and I bought a few little like an adventure module, basic fantasy role playing, basically first edition BX type stuff. And it just came in today. And so anyway, it's pretty cool. Yeah. A lot of OSR stuff on my, on my list. So good deal. So is that line of dragon? Is that a print on demand thing? Yes, that's where I purchased it from. Yeah. 
to go check that out. It sounded pretty good. He had a lot of other stuff. I was like, one thing. And I looked for trying to buy, I mentioned a few podcasts ago, I was going to try to buy his some, one of his products, which I did, and then one of Venger Satanis's. But in Venger, I've seen some, some of his videos and stuff. He seems fine, but I just, his stuff is too sex, man. It's too sexed up. Everything is about extreme gore or extreme kind of, it looks, I don't know, too extreme for me. So I'm not sure I can buy anything from Venger. I don't, and I wish him well, but it just doesn't sound like my cup of tea. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll get to see it at a con somewhere and flip through it and it won't be as bad as I think it is. But it strikes me as odd. And he's you mean uh, from the cover? The cover, some of the comments, the way he describes it, just doesn't sound. And he's big into weird, weird fantasy. Right, right. So, like uh, know, heavy metal. Yeah, heavy metal, 70s stuff, which is fine. I mean, he sounds like, a, he actually sounds like he'd be a fun D- GM, but I just don't want to. I don't know. It just kind of messes with my sensibilities. I'm not. I'm not down with it. All right. And but other than that, it was. I mean, I think it's. You know, I think the pundits a little bit more. I think he has some too that's a little bit blue. But I didn't. I get, don't know. I got Lion and Dragon sounding good. So yeah, yeah. Everything you can't expect to like everything, and oh, and, no, no, and, no. and nobody should expect everybody to like their stuff. No. Some people, I don't think either of those guys do. But no. who knows. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would like Venger stuff or not. It's just the way I read it on draft. Though, I was kind of like, eh. I read it. I did my due diligence, looked good, and said, no, nah, I can't do it. At least not right now. So yeah. we'll see. That's cool. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of good good news. Uh, Jason, Nerds Variety, mentioned something called, it's called a goat's worth of grotesques, which is the Baroque bestiary. And this guy made it, and it was really cool sounding what Jason said. So I'm going to pick up the PDF. It's really cheap. It's like four bucks for a 250 page monster book. And the way it's set up, it gives some, he gives some way you might do statistics, like vague statistics for a DD style game, but it's really pretty cool. I mean, the art's kind of, I don't know, kind of almost very medieval. And he doesn't, he even like describes like a wolf. And the way he describes a wolf, he gives it a, an air of mystery and legend, like some legends of like actual just regular wolves. And I thought, you know what? For four bucks, yeah, I'll pick it up. The art might be public domain. That might be he, why he it did. looks like that. But it looked kind of cool. I liked it. Yeah. It was Is it that I think I heard of this. Is it just it's just basically the fluff? Yeah, and it's called a groat's worth of grotesque. And I really I haven't I haven't uh, purchased it yet. I'll take before we got on here. I was I'll put it in my little basket there on drive through. But I'm thinking I'm going to because I mean Jason made it sound good, so I'm gonna get. He said it was good reading, so. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We have to yeah. look into that too. Yeah, fun stuff. So. All right. Alrighty. So moving to the main topic. We shall. Let's do it. Yeah. So today we're gonna jump into a hopefully a series we're gonna mess around with. A lot of podcasts have done this, and we're gonna try this a similar approach, but we'll see if we can add a little new spin to it. We're gonna do something called class and role. And we're going to talk about um, different classes, mainly focused on D&D. But we might be able to you know, branch out a little to more generally. But t- this first um, class and role episode is going to be on the divine and uh, divine analysis. So we're studying essentially the healer or the cleric. And it's going to be a recurring topic we hit from time to time. I'm sure we'll do the warrior and we'll do the mage and we'll do the rogue and maybe some others. I was thinking the gish might come along too. A gish would be a good discussion. Um, so a healer. In this, in a divine sense, it's only most RPGs that are fantasy. The healer guy is sort of the holy guy, right? He's a healer, is a generally tasked with restoring health, removing poison like effects, reviving, reviving, reviving. reviving. Thank you. Cannot read today. Fallen party members. Different games may include different mechanics, such as the ability to deal damage or to enhance the attributes of, needs of their allies. And I want to focus, of course, mainly on DD first. And somewhere along the line, we'll mention others. And we're going to Joe and I are going to kind of go through the different editions. And I took all the versions of the books that I had. I have, um, I use my PDF for the original D&D, uh, the white box. And then I used my rules encyclopedia, encyclopedia for Beck Me, And then all the editions of D&D I went through and highlighted what the cleric did in some of the descriptions. So anyway, how do you like that definition in general before we jump into D and D for a healer type? Right, it's good. Uh, it's okay. One thing I'll add though is mm-hmm. I know through the years there's been kind of a debate mm-hmm. about whether uh, heal the healer role should be precisely only 
divide. Right. Um, and many games spread it out. Right. I know, uh, and I still feel this way. I think magic is magic. Um, mm -hmm. So if there, if if you're using magic to heal, then I'm I'm not sure precisely. I understand you keep. Um, I understand from the point of view of uh, you have classes have their roles, and yep. you and uh, you have your cleric be your healer and your gen general holy person. Um, that's one role, and yep. the wizard is more general arcane. Right. And that way you you can have a team of people and then rely on uh, uh, teamwork to solve your problems. Right. So, and we'll get to, we'll get to that. I, I was pretty sure it sounds like going on a path. I know you've got some pretty, I don't say strong, yeah, probably some strong opinions on this, which are, which are interesting. We probably align pretty well. Uh, yeah. Let's focus, let's focus first of all, because I think I got us off the beaten path there. So back on the D and D cleric, right? The D and D cleric as, as a, as a sample healer, that's what most people mm -hmm. know as a healer, right? And through the additions and I'll, we'll bounce back and forth. I'll do, how about I do the evens and you do the odds. Does that sound good? Well, how are we going to do the zero? Uh, well, zero is even. Zero is, mm -hmm. I didn't know zero was even. As well by two, it's even. Okay, um, Te yeah. I guess technically one of those weirdo yeah, math things. Yeah, it has to be. It has to. Be, mm -hmm. um, no we remainder. Might, well, you could argue. Yeah, well, we could just it. Must not. Depends how you want to define it. it we'll, we'll start with zero. So uh, basically, the description I thought was fascinating it was done in one paragraph. Mm -hmm. This is the original booklet, Men and Magic, the first booklet for original Dungeons and Dragons white box. Um, it, they fight similar to the Finding Man. They have some spells like the Magic user. They mentioned there's no edge weapons. That's pretty consistent throughout. They get some bonus experience. And this, this changed later on, but just in general, it changed. And you turn with rolling 2d6, d6 hit dice like everybody else. Uh, technically no max level, but there was max hit points. So the cleric could get at most a cap of seven hit dice. And it was like plus two every level after that. And they got no spells until second level. And I said, no, race is class. The reason I said that is because there were no elven clerics. Or dwarven. No dwarven clerics, no halfling clerics. All clerics were human. That actually gets pointed out later on. But in OD&D, &D, I thought it was fascinating. He got one paragraph, and really not much was said other than that, that his job was to do a little bit of – and you didn't get that till you read the spell list. That he didn't even say he was kind of the healer, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Well, well, there may be um, built-in assumptions. Oh, that, that was the biggest thing I thought that from what I've read, I've read the whole white box. I don't have it. I have the PDF of it. I think it was almost like Guy Gax and Arneson. Not almost. It was from the history. They made this game essentially for their friends. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, they thought everybody that already had war gaming experience and played Chainmail would knew all that they're talking about. I've mentioned before, when it came to the elf, they said, look at Chainmail. That was the elf entry. If you really, <laughs> really don't want to play a human, you know, got guy guys, if you got to be a real weirdo, that's that wasn't God X's word, but that was kind of the implication. You can play an elf, and so um, that's all they said. So and then the cleric gets a big upgrade in Beckme. You want to take that one? Uh, six hit uh, d six hit dice up to ninth level. Mm -hmm. uh, at tenth level, uh, plus one per level. After that, mm -hmm. from there on. Person dedicated to great or worthy cause may serve a deity or deities or his own alignment. Yeah, so it's, it's weird serving your That's alignment. Weird. They could serve you could serve an alignment. That was weird. Yeah. yeah. No edged or pointy weapons. Uh, bonus XP for thirteen or higher wisdom. D and D doesn't deal with ethical or theological beliefs. They said that of a PC yeah. uh, that you have a star next to. Uh, anyway. If mm -hmm. act inconsistent with alignment, punished by or um, punished by order, the order of clerics that you are belong. This to. is this is kind of my summary notes. Would it do better if I hit them? No, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. It, or um, or higher power DM uh, DM say uh, mm -hmm. no spells until a level two. Spells come from the strength of clerics' beliefs. May uh, turn undead, but not attack in the same round. PC rolls two d six to determine if success by table. Uh, the DM rolls 2d6 for total hit dice. At least one. You get at least one Yep. when you turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you reach ninth level, a neutral cleric can become a druid. <laughs> Landowner, cleric, uh, and traveling. Cleric, yep. Cleric, limited uh, political influence, 
uh, cleric described. Uh, you got a bracket there, domain discussion. Note also race is class because in Beckman you have the same thing. Yeah. Race is class, only humans can be clerics. Yeah, so my asterisk there, Joe, was notice they said in one sentence, D&D &D doesn't deal with ethical or theological beliefs. This is me being probably a little pedantic of a PC, but spells come from the strength of a cleric's beliefs. Yeah, how does he... Not from the deity, which is cool, but they mentioned beliefs, but they said we don't deal with PC beliefs. Well, <laughs> it's in the background. Yeah, I think the idea was we don't want to deal with Christianity, Islam, Judaism. We don't have those kind of... I think that was the thing they were afraid of. We don't want to have a... You know, a lot of people say, even today, if you want to cause trouble, talk religion or talk politics. Right. So I'm sure they're like, we don't want trouble. We're playing a game. Beliefs are beliefs. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about what they are. And every cleric belonged to an order. Mm -hmm. That was in the rules. You actually belonged to an order. And when you got to the right level, you could either build a church, temple, stronghold, or became a traveling cleric. And there was even rules for like, well, if you decide to be a traveler for a while, then you decide to go back and be a landowner. You can do that as a cleric, but the DM needs to make sure you're not cheeseballing things. And <laughs> it was really fascinating to read some of the... I think there was some really good advice in there, things that that kind of wet my whistle for old school. I mean, we had a, an episode on domains, you know, ca characters building domains, and that's kind of been left by the wayside in modern mm -hmm. game. Yep, yep. Um, because I don't know. I don't know why there's a because. It just is. Yeah. And it may be uh, that a lot of players don't care, and that's kind of bled into the development of the game. So the game has gone in that direction. It could be. Who knows? My, uh, my thought is, I think, here's what I think it is. And this is, I'm not trying to be a fuddy-duddy, but I think um, video games, you only play one person. in. Now, for a while, they had, you could run some adventures where you played a group, but you're pretty much playing one main dude. Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, well, people like to play one dude. And D&D &D is kind of a one dude playing thing. And we want to get more and more powerful and get more gear. You know, maybe we don't want to mess with this stuff. Or maybe it's just hard to write rules for that stuff. Because players being as creative as they are, it's hard unless if you put them in a really tight box, you can only spend your money this way. You can only this thing with the gold and cost this much money. And then players are like, you know, I got to do all that rigmarole. And even the DM, I'm like, can't we just like roll a couple of dice, multiply it by a thousand, so that's how much it costs? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so kind of. It might be they dropped it from having specific rules. And mm -hmm. if a table wants to do it in the modern game, they do it their own way. In the early editions, especially original D&D, they came from war gaming. They, and, and you, you know, you love this. They love low level. And I remember one of them saying, somebody, I think it was Secrets of Blackmore. They just couldn't fathom. Why would someone want to play someone higher than seventh or eighth level? Yeah. Because they described you as a superhero already, mm -hmm. which is true because their version of fantasy was much lower. It wasn't yeah. like, it was closer to Lord of the Rings, nowhere near like, Super D and Dness, you know. Right. So, anything strike you? Either yeah. The original or Beckme that kind of right. it, just from my memory, when we talk about turning. Yes. Okay, so uh, we played recently um, an old school game at Cabin Con, yep. and nice. looking at the turning rules because mm -hmm. we had a cleric in the party. Yep. When you look at the turning table, it's very generous. I thought so too. But I think I know why. What do they oh, expect? Oh. To me, it's, it's the expectation is you run into bunches of undead. Yep, that's one. You would have to for it to and be. What was the game. most, especially in Beckney and beyond, what was the most fearsome thing about undead? The higher level undead. Slightly oh, higher. energy drain. Energy drain was, because dude, that's costly. You lose XP. And um, in some of the rules though, I want to say it was 1E. We'll find out shortly. I think I noted this. They did say you would lose levels within 24 hours, but so you have 24 hours to go get a restoration cast and get your level back before you was permanent. But I think maybe back then it was because it was so deadly, they really wanted the clerics to um, be able to handle that. Though it was very vague in both those editions, I don't recall if they told me how many times in a day. I don't think there was any limit. I think every round you could try to turn, which was pretty. Yeah, I don't remember there yeah. being a limit. It came along later on. It yeah. come along. Anything else strike you as interesting or odd? Or Yeah, I want to. The only thing that strikes me is 
no edged weapons. I know that was true. Yep, that was consistent. Both editions there. Both of those. But I'm oh. wondering how consistent that became later. Oh, it changed. Because I, I'm pretty sure you, I remember the idea, no edged weapons. And you're like, that's weird. They can't yeah, even like, use a dagger. Well, there was a comment. I want to say I read it online and it was about Gygax reading some, some, I think it was a website. I wish I had, had saved it had read some story about a priest and it was, you know, like a, a fantasy story. And he talked about what was the biblical quote, live by the sword, die by the sword. And so a cleric lives by the mace. <laughs> that was the idea that cleric, that cleric was like, you shouldn't live by a sword, shouldn't try to, and clear, in one of the statements, I forget which edition of the division, which edition of the game they mentioned, but the clerics were, one of the things was they tried not to do violent stuff. They didn't, they kind of abhorred violence. I might have had that written down in there somewhere. So, oh, it is. It's in uh, 2E actually. But let me, uh, shall we move to 1E or? Yeah. What do you, okay. So 1E, this is not, I wrote here, it's like Beckney, but here's some exceptions. Now the minimum wisdom becomes nine, 13 for a multi class cleric. What do you think of that? And this is in 1E. I never and, understood that. I think no, it's just uh, a control thing. It's uh, you know yeah. to control who, how many multi-class characters you had running around. Oh, and uh, boy, they want. But multi-class was pretty boss in first level. Or did you? Could you? You could do that as an elf, right? Couldn't you be a fighter magic user right, right off the gate? Yeah, but you have yeah. level limits. Which if you kept the game low, that's irrelevant. It is. Yeah, that's that, and that's one of the problems in old school. If you keep games low level, multi-class has become a lot of more powerful. Now you get the bonus experience points again, but not until like five or ten percent, but not until you get a 15 or higher wisdom. And then they make a suggestion they didn't make before. Strength and con are also good for clerics. Mm -hmm. And it says, and this is the the description of one A of a cleric, resembles religious orders of medieval knights. That's how they describe them. So almost paladin-esque. Uh, D8 hit dice, so there's a bump. Max 9, 10th level, plus 2 per level. So 9 hit dice, most you could have, then plus 2 per level. Uh, dedicated to deities or deity. Skilled combatant, and this is a phrase that comes up again and again or some version of it. Clerics are there to fortify, protect, and heal their allies and companions. That's their job. Um, true neutral was not allowed for a cleric. A cleric could not be true neutral in first edition. If you were true neutral, you were a druid. Oh, that's right. Turning undead, and this is a, now this is an important thing here. The first time they said this, you must present your holy symbol. Positioning was mentioned. You have, remember, I used to always use the phrase, you must present yourself boldly. Mm -hmm. That's the way I phrased it. And mm -hmm. that's mostly where I got it from. Uh, P, now the PCs would roll a D20 instead of 2D6, and the DM would roll a D12. And you could even turn a D2 minor demons and devils. That was really not explained well in the first edition player's handbook. It didn't tell me what demons or devils. It just said the phrase minor. So I don't, you know, it's probably up to the DM at higher levels. No level limit for human clerics. Only humans can be single classed clerics. So an elf could not be an elf cleric alone. At ninth level, they got a stronghold. And here was the big boom, half price. So if your church cost you 80,000 gold to build, you could build it for 40 because you got a lot of free help from, you know, parishioners and followers. You did get spells at level one. Uh, evil clerics was mentioned. They could turn good aligned beings in paladins. Good aligned beings wasn't clear if that was meant to be even other player characters. I would say probably not. I'm sure they were talking things like angels and various, you know, supernatural <laughs> the creature called a shidu, which is kind of a you know, they were lawful good and they helped people, but maybe those sorts of things. Right. Now, you have said before you liked 1E better than 2E, correct? Well, from the point of view of, um, I think my one complaint from 2E is damage caps on spells. Yeah. I thought that was unnecessary. More screwage for the wizard. Yeah. Especially, so especially if your expectation is not to play over seventh level, a rule such as that makes no sense. Anyway, that doesn't have anything much to do with clerics. They didn't have right. a lot of damaging spells. No, they did not. And notice that clerics... And again, they mentioned the stronghold idea, which is true for not just clerics. That was for every class had a stronghold or a guild or a tower. Wizard tower was common. Um, I thought the turning of paladins was interesting. Just the yeah, the that is. And speaking of paladins, my this is where I first noticed, uh, not when we, not maybe when we were first playing it, 
Mm -hmm. But it didn't take long to see, for me, the similarity in the description of a cleric and a paladin. Yes. They are. They have a similar description. They use a lot of the same words. They're, they use synonyms, yep. but it's essentially the same thing. A paladin holy is a holy knight. Yep. A cleric is a holy knight. <laughs> yep. What's the difference? Yeah. Pick one. Yeah. yeah. So they had a hit dice bump, which was good. I thought the fortify protected hilf to describe their general job was uh, pretty good. That will repeat itself in at least, I think, second edition is unvariant. Um, I've noticed the big points was the, the dice change. They started using D20 more. And, the, and you turn a D12 instead of 2D6. I wonder if that was just because, you know, we have a D12. Why don't we use it? I heard that was kind of, I heard Maybe. some rules. I heard that was the case. And Gagax made some rules just so you had to use the D12. So, That's weak. <laughs> it funny. is. It I is. Know. I don't disagree, but it's funny. Uh, one e, yeah. So the clerks looked pretty cool in one e. I mean, that was kind of neat. So you want to yeah. try a second? Yeah. Uh, two e. Do you need me to clerks, clarify? Warrior mm -hmm. priest, wizard rogue. Within yep. priest is cleric, like one e, but okay. Mm -hmm. So in second edition, uh, I'm not. I don't understand why you did that beginning part. Okay, let me. Let me clarify. What I'm saying is in second edition, to clarify, I had forgotten this. There were class groups. There was the warrior group underneath, which was um, the, the, was the fighter, the paladin, and the ranger. There was the priest, which underneath the priest was the cleric and the druid. And then the wizard was the illusionist and, the, and I think the mage. They called him the mage in second edition. And under the rogue was the assassin and the thief. I don't remember the mage. Yep, mage is what they call the wizard. Wizard was the broad category. Mage was the specific class. That's weird. Yep, that's how they did it. Yep. Okay, so uh, within priest is cleric. No, it's like one E, except yep. charisma and con are good instead of strength, strength. and con because, right. yeah, some changes there. Sturdy mm -hmm. soldiers reluctant to shed blood using only blunt weapons, which is weird because you can draw blood with a blunt weapon. <laughs> you most definitely can. <laughs> Spells are the main tool of the cleric, helping him to serve, protect, and revitalize those under his care. Yep. Spheres of influence became something in second edition. Uh, major access all to all but but animal, plant, weather, and elemental, because those were for the druid. Uh, minor, max level, third. So, elemental. Yeah, what I said, third they, level they, spells. They, they got access to elemental minorly. Clerics yeah. did. So they had protection from elements. Right. That was yeah. right. Receive spells as insight from Deity himself. Ninth level official permission to build stronghold. Again, half price, but without church sanction if done before ninth level. So in other words, you didn't get the half price deal if the if the if you did before ninth level and the church didn't sanction you to do ah. it. Especially priests, uh, which came a little later, didn't they? Well, they're actually in the core book. Okay. They only gave you a few ideas. They got expanded on the Forgotten Realms. You got tons of them. Tons. They had a, they had a handful in, in the rules, and they just. Didn't they have, did they have three books on that that they had? Yes, and I had, and they were, you know, they were actually pretty cool. Yeah, they, they were. A lot of stuff. Uh, especially priests have extra requirements such as wisdom nine and strength count thirteen for battle god, is given. All spheres of influence are deity based and granted powers, and Druid is a specialty priest of nature. Yep. Uh, for turning undead, you roll a d20 for the PC. Um, DM, then you roll 2d6 for the number of undead. Oh, okay. Roll 2d6 for the number of undead, forcing free willed undead closer than 10 feet breaks the turn. The first time they ever mentioned breaking the turn. Right. Then second. So, so free willed undead, so what you're saying here, if you force them... Closer than ten feet. Right. So, are you talking about to, to a bear? If they're your oh yeah, you, that you breaks the holy turns. symbol, you turn the vampire, but you push him into a corner. Once you get inside ten feet, he, it breaks the turning attempt. Right, right, okay. That's what I thought you meant. Evil clerics turn paladins at uh, minus three levels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, couldn't even begin to do it till they were fourth. I remember that. Right. A lot of that. A lot of that. I liked. I, I always liked the spe the specialty priest. Even they were they were definitely 
I mean, the cleric was already, in my opinion, pretty OP as a class. Right. A person that would be willing, we'll talk about who's willing to play, but especially priests took them over the top. There were some oh, special sure. priests, especially with, with the Forgotten Realm booklets we talked about, like Faiths and Avatars. I remember we had uh, my cousin Ryan played a priest of Tempest, and he got just some of the best abilities right out the game. We're like, what the crap? It was yeah. unbelievable. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that they, maybe someone, uh, other than me noticed that the paladin and cleric were described very similarly. Mm -hmm. So maybe they decided to change things up a bit in their description and make them uh, more focused on their spells because, and uh, one thing that isn't noted, I don't think is that at one point clerics only had spells at the seventh level. Yes. I didn't now, know. That's true. I, did that, that didn't change until third edition, though, Correct. right? Correct. was true. Yep. That was true in first and second. And I think um, maybe fifth was the highest at some point. That might have been everybody only had up to fifth level spells. Some of the editions of the game only had fifth and sixth. I think it was, oh, oh original oh, D&D had yeah. fifth or sixth level spells. I, I did thought it was interesting to note that they changed their suggestions for secondary stats, charisma and con instead of strength and con. And notice they did mention that their, their sturdy soldiers were reluctant to shed blood, even though you mentioned that, yeah, that's not the case. And they used serve, protect, and revitalize rather than fortify, protect, and heal. Right. So that was interesting. Right. Um, it's kind of a weird uh, a weird thing to expect an adventuring priest. Unless you play your cleric such that you don't attack like humans but you're only attacking monsters and you don't have a whole big problem with shedding monster blood, but maybe you don't, maybe you just refrain from attacking humans and you, yeah. you know, do other things if you're faced with brigands and whatnot, but right. it's kind of weird. Yeah. We'll talk more about that. The cleric is kind of a, yeah, why not? it's an odd duck. Yeah. That's about third edition. I'm going to do three E and I'm going to let you do three, five and pathfinder. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're small. And then maybe I'll take fourth. I won't say much about fourth because, as I said, we played very little. Yeah. So 3E was a major shift, a major change in rules, big differences, but D8 hit dice and no limit now. 20th level plus con. So every level plus con all the way through. They had some spell casting target numbers changed, 10 plus a spell level. Again, they suggested charisma and con. Knowledge religion is an intelligence based proficiency. I understand that. But I always thought it was pretty stupid that a wizard could actually know more about a religion than, a, than an actual cleric. I mean, he could literally know more about the cleric's own religion than the cleric. Right. Especially. And he, and he could he, be an atheist. He could be an atheist wizard. The <laughs> idea of the dump stat is introduced, as far as I know, in third edition because of the way you build your characters. I don't remember us talking like that. Before Not then. as much, though. We talked a little bit about charisma and if you weren't a paladin, who cares? Right. Because people, you, you would put your worst score in charisma because you didn't care, and you can't. And uh, I know that in oh original D and D they talked about, or was it Beckme? One of them they talked about that a cleric couldn't mess with his wisdom score, who was his prime, but he could change some others and bump his wisdom up, give three and one, take two or three from one stat and add one to his wisdom. So there was some of that exchanging and some possibility of dump statting even early on. But the phrase dump stat became significant in three. Right. Right. Yeah. That whole, I think the, while I initially liked the proficiency stuff that was introduced in uh, third edition, eventually it became kind of silly. Well, especially when they said, well, proficiency with, they gave clerics proficiencies with simple weapons, armor, and shields. Simple weapons actually opened a lot of things up. Sure. And the clerics with certain domains, I remember like the clerics of Coralon Lorethia and Elven God would get the long sword. Yeah. Which I remember thinking, whoa, that is so powerful. It's not really. And they did it in the domains, too. They did it back in the second edition. Yeah. Um, they, alignment wise, they had to be within one step of their deity now. And they could not be neutral unless their deity was neutral for third edition. Right. They prepare and cast spells, but also they got two domain spells uh, per level, sort of as a free prep. So it would, if they pick the domain of knowledge, they might get read magic and something else for free was always prepared for them. They got granted powers, not too different from specialty priests. Um, wisdom actually added to spells per day. A lot of this is just the mechanical changes. Uh, spont this is the new thing. This is something I thought was really good. 
people used to complain in second, you know, I, I got to memorize all these heal spells. I can't cure spells. I can't memorize some of the cooler spells, even neutralized poison. I need to have healing. Now you could spontaneous, a good cleric or a neutral cleric who worshiped a good deity could spontaneously turn any of his spells into a cure version. So if you were a second level cure spell, you could do cure serious wounds instead of whole person if you needed it. So it gave you a lot more flexibility. Um, similarly, evils could, now it was weird. I never understood why evil clerics would still, I guess because they're evil, they get to inflict damage, but wouldn't they want to heal their allies anyway? That would seem yeah, it's to a be weird. Hard. It's a kind of a weird rule, mm -hmm. but I think it's because uh, they're the good deities uh, channeled positive energy. Yep. And then the evil deities channeled negative energy. If, but yep. if that's the case, perhaps evil clerics who get negative energy shouldn't even get healing spells because they're all positive. True. And I think there was some talk early on in the, in the game about can, I think why used to do it at the table, can good clerics even cast inflict wounds? Right, right. I mean, but I think they should be able to. But I mean, I, I understand if you're going to get that picky. Uh, but then that means evil clerics can't heal anybody, which is kind of weird. Uh, they finally put a maximum turns per day. They actually talked about it. Right. Uh, number of turns per day. Now that was based on your charisma modifier plus three. Your turn check was a D20 plus charisma. That determined your highest level of undead. It was based upon the cleric's level. So you make a turn check, say you roll a 15, you might get to do your level plus two. If you roll a, if you roll an eight, you got to do your level minus three. And it was between minus four and plus four. So basically it was based on the creature's head dice. Um, the damage, they called it turning damage. It was no damage at all. It was 2d6 plus clear hit dice uh, plus charisma. Basically, it determined the number of uh, hit dice of the undead you could affect. Pathfinder re-changes that completely. Um, anything within 60 feet, the duration was 10 rounds. You could attack turned creatures at range. If you got closer than 10 feet, you could break it. If you did melee, you could break it. Um, they would cower and give you bonuses to attack. Evil clerics could command and bolster undead. Neutrals could do what's called rebuke, which is basically make them cower. Uh, they got level one spells. They could get multiple attacks. Uh, I wrote their 20th level base attack bonus was plus 15, plus 10, plus five. So every 20th level cleric had that as a basis. And of course, feats and other things, action types, all that modified. You know, third edition was all about minutia making change in this plus one, this minus two, and this plus four. And next thing you know, you got Codzilla is what they called him, right? right. The cleric of doom. The clerics, right. were, clerics were pretty boss. Right. Right. And it, uh, if you if you got to a certain level, you got a few spells running. Oh, dude. What, oh, was the Holy one Trinity? The Holy Trinity. We used to refer to it in third edition as the Holy Trinity. Then we get divine power. Righteous might. Righteous might. And then there's another one. That gave them bonuses, turned their base attack into fighter base attacks. Divine second level spell. So it's three spells. And the cleric was sit down, fighter, sit down, everybody. I'm about to roll in here with the biggest attack bonus, the biggest damage, and I'm going to murder something for about nine, 10 rounds. Right. And it never became useless. As you got higher levels, it was great. And you could get it off even faster if you had a, if you're a fifth level higher party, you had your wizard cast uh, haste on you. Yep. And you could cast two spells. Yep. And then the next round you had your other spell up. Oh, remember we talked about the deadly combo, right? At high level. Haste harm. Haste harm. Dude. So a cleric could literally in one turn be as hasted. Or say, yeah, let's say he had a yeah, he so he gets the clear the wizard haste everybody or haste him. He rolls up to the dragon, moves up, he casts harm, and which is one him. action. And hits the clerk and hits the dragon. It's a touch attack, almost guaranteed. And then smackety smackety, D four hit points left. Dragon dead. Yeah. No matter how many hit points the dragon had. Right. That was pretty broken. Yeah. It I was. Remember, yeah. And then three five, the cleric got even worse. There weren't tons of changes, but yeah. I'll let you know, chat about three five and Pathfinder. I put Pathfinder in here because it's just it's basically three seven five. Yeah, I'm going to talk about those two. I'm going to mm -hmm. read the notes and then we can talk about it as a piece because. Sure. Third edition, three five, and Pathfinder one e are all of the piece. They're um, all piece. So three five is modified to three e, which is like it, but some skills changed, spell descriptions changed, cleric changed, but the cleric itself changed very little. They 
a lot of three, five changes were like, well, since we're going to make a three, five, we're just going to make some modifications to lots of spells. Right. <laughs> it didn't. Okay. The way I think the way three, five impacted the cleric was, um, haste got changed so yep. that it doesn't, it didn't let you cast more than one spell in a round. Right. So haste harm was out. Yeah. Um, well, the, you had, you know, that wasn't out because the, 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 um, the, the wizard still could, had to cast it. The cleric wasn't casting it on himself. Weren't there domain spells though that you could do that with? Could you get you haste? You might, you might. There, there might have been a domain spells cleric. With the domain spells, yeah. Right. So that you might, cheat, there might have been a, them. there might have been a couple of cleric, uh, domains where that they got screwed out of that. Right. But, um, and then Pathfinder is like three, five, but channel energy, uh, instead of turning, uh, number of times per day is three plus charisma modifier. It's a three, 30 foot burst doing positive or negative energy damage, depending on the alignment of the cleric. Mm -hmm. uh, it's D six plus a D six for two levels past first. There's a will save for half damage. Um, which is 10 plus half cleric level plus charisma modifier added uh, uh, clerical horizons, which zero level uh, spells for clerics. Basically cantrips. Cantrips. Uh, as much as you want up to a maximum of eight different ones per day by the spell table, depending on what yep. your level is. Yep. But yeah, so some, uh, I think the channel energy was a pretty significant change. Yep. <clears throat> we played the beta version of that. Do you remember, do you remember that? But you can heal, heal, and and uh, harm at the same time. They fixed that. That was like so a good cleric could channel. So you're fighting a bunch of undead, and the cleric just steps up in a thirty foot burst and, and channels all the characters heal. All the undead take damage at the same time. They changed that. Yeah, <laughs> I still don't think that's a huge problem because it's a, it's a it's a um, edge case because they could if if you're not fighting undead, it's not a big deal, right? But I get it. I get it. So yeah, um, I like the fact that you don't turn undead anymore. I like the damage part of it because I really don't like the turn undead mechanic because it makes. Monty Cook said this: the turning undead mechanic from first and second edition turns an encounter into a non-encounter. Uh, unless you have hordes of undead, just hordes. Yeah, because yeah. you, or you didn't take too many levels before the cleric was turning all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you eventually turn in liches with a 12. Or a could, yeah, yeah. yeah you uh, could vampire mm -hmm. at 7th level, I think. If I, I think you could correctly. get to where, I'm trying to remember, but in 1st edition, I think you could get a T on a Spectre. That was the most powerful thing. The T being automatic. automatic. And you could not destroy vampires or turn off. I think a 4 was a vampire, and I think a 7 was a lich at like 19th level. Now, granted, that's crazy high level, but still, I mean, a lich, I don't know. I, I, I just don't like turning. I mean, I understand it, but I don't really like it because I don't like it. I don't know. I just, well. If, if it was some kind of a will contest between yes. the vampire and the PC, that'd be one thing. Yeah. But it's not that. It's just a straight roll against a, a table that makes, uh, if you have a cleric in the party, undead or kind of, who cares? Yeah, mid level, you get ninth, tenth level, even sixth, seventh level cleric, like undead. You have a chance to turn a lich. A lich could be an eighteenth, so it could be an eighteenth level magic user lich, and you'd be like, be gone. We're sixth level, whatever. Get out of here. Roll a fifteen, you're gone. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I never liked that part of it. Right, right. So that makes sense. But third edition was a big power up. Yes. Well, a change. I mean, a second edition was a power, a definite power up from third, from first. Mm -hmm. Yes. With the domains and the domain mm -hmm. clerics. Once they, yep. those books were out. Um, third. Because there were clearly was, domains that were better than others too. Oh yeah, very much so. Um, and then in third edition, it changed again. Uh, so the domains were kind of still there, but then, but they were presented differently, and. Uh, I think that um, I'm not sure. I think they remained on par. I don't know if it was a, necessarily a power up for the cleric in particular. I mean, third edition was a power up in general. 
yeah. for everybody, but I don't know if in particular the cleric got more powerful beyond this the game. I'll change. make a shout out to one of our boys, Philip. Mm -hmm. He used to cheese ball the cleric and he would disagree, probably, maybe not. He would he took there were some words in I know in Pathfinder, you didn't have to worship a deity. You could just pick two domains, I believe. And then that was, I think that was codified in Pathfinder. It was talked about a lot in third three five. And he would just because you could you could cherry pick the ideal domains and then you build some faith or belief system around them, which doesn't sound bad, but there's certain spells and powers that made crazy combos. You know, so, you know, and I always preferred, I always, and I would, you know, I would always prefer that you would have to pick a deity and whatever the deities domains are you get, or if I create deities and give them domains, you got to have those. You don't get to pick your own. Um, that's just a little, that's a little too good. It was yeah, too, easy so. to cheese it. too easy to cheese it. I mean, the clerics are already tough as it is. They're already super tough. Yeah. Right. Right. Good hit points, good fighting, good. And three of the spells too, their spells were better. I mean, we talked about Holy, the Holy Trinity. I mean, that alone, you couldn't pull that crap off in first and second edition D and D. Right. But yeah. there's still, you had, a, it wasn't, the cleric wasn't chosen a lot. No. And that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little, little bit later on too, but for sure. Yeah, the, why wasn't the cleric chosen? That's interesting. Right. Okay, you mean to take fourth edition? Yeah. Okay, so this is nothing like any of the editions before. And I'm not pooping on it, though I don't care for it. Um, I like the cleric was considered a divine leader, battle leaders who are invested with divine power. They blast foes with magical prayers, bolster and heal companions, and lead the way to victory with the mace in one hand and a holy symbol in the other. Got that from the DD 4E wiki. And that sounds good. Um, they had, of course, in this game now, every class had at will encounter and daily powers. It's a total rewrite of the rules. So some of this stuff doesn't really compare. I don't think any of it, I don't think it compares well to old DD. No, third edition. Uh, weapon proficiencies, simple melee, simple range, uh, implement proficiency, holy symbol, hit points. They started with 12 plus their con score. Mm -hmm. so that must be a 14 con, that's 26 hit points. At first level, plus five each additional level after. That's simplified. They had seven plus their con modifier and surges. And Turn Undead was not too far from the Pathfinder idea of channeling divine power. One, one effect was a Turn Undead. There were other effects, too, that you could do, um, doing more hit points of damage. Again, they don't have a lot to say about fourth edition, but the whole the whole system itself was very different. They did have a nice description of the cleric, and I think all the classes would probably sound in like paragraph form. Their roles were the same idea, but uh, people could actually heal on their own without the cleric, I believe. But I think maybe in fourth edition, the, the cleric helped them activate their healing surges. Those out there who played for you could explain it a little bit more to us. Right. Because uh, we, was Joe played, did you play at all? Did you ever play a session of fourth no. edition? Okay, I played a few, but I don't remember how the cleric worked exactly. Right. Do you want to tackle your new favorite edition? Yes, fifth edition. My <laughs> favorite. <laughs> a conduit for divine power and reliance on devotion and intuitive sense of their deity's wishes. Must be nice. That's yeah. <laughs> uh spellcasting is uh DC spellcasting DC, eight plus yes. proficiency bonus plus wisdom modifier. Uh, spell attack modifier equals proficiency bonus plus wisdom modifier. Prefer a number of spells equal to cleric level plus wisdom modifier. That's Holy total symbol. number. That's total, total number. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Holy symbol is a spell casting focus. They are a ritual caster. Um, change the list of pre uh, prepared spells after a long rest and domain bonus spells prepared and granted powers based on level. They get cantrips and two spells at level one. So pause. The clerics went from no spells at level one uh -huh. to two now over the additions. Right. Plus like, cantrips. Right, plus cantrips. And cantrips in fifth edition are no weenie spells. Yeah, Sacred Flame is pretty boss. Yeah. Uh, at level one. Uh, D8 hit dice. Mm -hmm. eight plus con at level one. Because they get max hit points. Yeah. Uh, they, they have, uh, for proficiencies... Light armor, medium armor, shields, which is a change because in earlier editions they could use heavy armor. I'm yep. pretty sure. Yep. Um, simple weapons. Uh, no tools. They can't use tools. They don't have proficiency in any tools. No. Not even any tool that could resemble clerical. They couldn't have things. a hammer. 
Yeah, they cannot use a hammer proficiently when they're trying to spike spike the thing, the nail down into the or the or well, spike the wooden stake into the vampire's heart. Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> they would miss a lot because they can't use tools. Anyway, <laughs> saving throws uh, are wisdom and charisma, where they get their bonuses at. For skills, they choose two from history, insight, medicine, persuasion, and religion. Mm -hmm. um, channel divinity. One such effect is turning undead. Uh, once per long rest. Wow. Or once per short rest. Depending. Or short, yeah. Mm -hmm. Present holy symbol and speak a prayer. Each undead within 30 feet make a wisdom save or turn for one minute. Uh, can only use, and turning is the same, they run away, right? Well, there's no... Undead can only use dash or dodge. Yep. Dash or dodge. Actions. No way to break the turning effect. At fifth level, undead turn are destroyed up to if its CR is less than or equal to the hit, die, hit die threshold. So that they have that little table. Basically, the highest level undead you can actually destroy are four hit dice undead or less. Oh, okay. But, I don't know. That's weird. Yeah. So it, does it, it starts low, like at fifth level. Yeah, you, you, it's a half hit dice. So in considering you're doing level appropriate encounters for D&D, &D, mm -hmm. this will never get used. No, 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 no. Because in fifth edition, um, skeletons are CR 1 8th. And the way they do that, I don't know the rules, but I know that like if you're fifth, fifth level, I do not put you against four. I do not put you against a CR 5. I'll put you against something lower. Yeah, but that low? Uh, maybe not half. If I did half, it'd be a lot of them. But it means yeah. you could turn. Yeah. It's more than, it's lower than you would think. The the scales. I mean, yeah, but as far as destroying, it seems less than useful. Yeah, I agree. Uh, level 10, implore DD to intervene on your behalf. Roll to a D, roll D, uh, roll D20, equal to or lower than your cleric level. If success, must wait a week to try again. And at level 20, this succeeds automatically. <laughs> well, because you have to right. roll a d20. Well, but I mean, but you could at level 20, 20, you go, I want my God to help me out every week, once a week. Once a week, you're going to do what I say. Wow. Yeah. That's whatever. You know, I think a lot of 5 it's funny. I think when I think about 5e and 4e, 4E sounded good on paper when they described it. And then mm -hmm. when I got it, I was like, ugh. Right. 5E doesn't sound good at all when you read it. It sounds kind of weenie. Like you, I think that's that's a good description. And kind of weenie is not the right word. It's kind of bizarre. And then when you play, I kind of enjoy it. I don't hate 5E at all. Not really. I know you don't you think it's just horrible, but I, I think it's very palatable. Like I've said, my attitude on their um, uh, design mm -hmm. direction mm -hmm. uh, is coloring my and I'm not stopping that it's coloring my opinion of their rules fair enough and uh, I don't care yeah, I mean okay. if fine. I if I try to uh, take a step back I still think this particular last thing that we just read yeah I mean, so at 20th level, I mean, once a week, that's a once a week wish, probably. That's like automatic all, wish. That's all it says. It says you can employ your deity to intervene on your behalf. I mean, is Thor going to come down and kick some dragon's face in? Okay. So by, I don't know how direct you took this. Mm -hmm. You can implore all you like. Doesn't mean it's going to work. Right. Which to me, you, uh, if that is the case, uh, why ever even have that power? So, if you're successful on your roll, that mean you have that means you have successfully implored your deity to intervene on your behalf. Correct. Whatever that might mean. Mm -hmm. So, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just an opinion. I probably a style. I guess the way it is because five e. You know, sometimes I just didn't get how people said five e was like super heroic it seemed kind of weird but i think it is i mean and i think it assumes look at the beginning a 5e cleric a conduit for divine power and reliance on devotion and intuitive sense of their deity's wishes a first level cleric has an intuitive sense of what his deity wants done yeah oh, that's weird and then at 20th level you can calm down once a week 
well, you know, call him down strong, but still, I mean, he could essentially get, he could intervene on your behalf. What does that mean? It's got to be some kind of useful help. And so, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be that. And I'm sure people could call in and go, but you could do this and you could, but it just seems, it seems they want to play super. You are, play, I get that. That's a superhero. That's a, that's a superhero type game where you're just like that super powerful and you got, got the connection. You got the hookup right from first level. If your spells are from your deity, mm -hmm. you're already successfully imploring your deity multiple times every day to give you power over your enemies. So what does it make sense that your cleric also can just pick some random thing for your deity to do for you? But to be fair, a 20th level cleric is a paragon, I'm, I believe would be a paragon of the virtues that his deity espoused. And he would be someone the deity is kindly favored toward. I so get that. It, I, I think it would be possible. I think that might have a chance. For, I think I, we used to call them God calls back in the day. I think I used to give you what, 1% or 5%? One, yeah, it was very 1%. Small. But it was like, that was for everybody. And clerics might get double that, so they get 2%. But I mean, it was like, it's one of those things where I can see it, I guess. But I don't know. It's just, for my sensibilities, gods aren't, they're not waiting around for you to call them to do stuff. They're not at your beck and call, but I can see you being favored. And I can see an intervention being something like some fortuitous, um, convenient thing. Oh my gosh, I'm slipping off this ledge. The dragon smacks me and I fall off. And as I fall, there just happens to be a very sturdy branch about 15 feet, 20 feet down. No, more than that. And it's far away from the dragon. He thinks you're dead. You fall below the cloud line because you're way up high on a mountain and you happen to just grab it. That's okay. Yeah. I can see that, you know, um, and I guess it depends on what you want to play. I mean, if you if you want to play, they're just that awesome. Go ahead. I don't know, but we're getting off on on opinion. So as a as a as a character, it just strikes me as you're kind of like getting lots and lots of cool stuff. And so I don't think the five E cleric is any weaker than the previous versions of, no. of other clerics within the game mechanics. So um, we kind of hit the highlights on the cleric, and let's talk about a couple things we've mentioned. Um, remember the adages folks used to call clerics heel bots right and we talked about how tough they were and no one wanted to play them why was that that was because weird you, because you were expected to heal yeah and that means you really didn't have i mean you'd have to be prepared to sacrifice what you were doing at the time at in the round mm -hmm. i mean after combat is one thing but if you're called on within the fight you mm -hmm. had to sacrifice and especially in early editions whatever you were going to do otherwise to heal right and uh i remember someone playing a clear saying don't expect me to heal you in combat i'm not doing it i have heard i that. might not i might not he, he was like I, what do you mean heal i don't do that i might charge heal. you charge yeah, you charging you remember that yeah 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 for different alignments, I would mm -hmm, charge you for mm -hmm. that. Like, okay, that's weird. But I don't know. So, yeah, I think that was some of the drawbacks. Um, do you like to play them? Yeah. Um, I like playing spellcasters, but they're there. And I, I don't know about fifth edition or fourth edition, but I I probably would if there wasn't a wizard. Yeah. Didn't you play a cleric pretty through the pretty well through the third edition levels? I day? did. I did. Also. That was because the wizard was denied me in this campaign. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh boo. Do not deny me a wizard. Was well, that worth was party didn't... balance? Huh? Was it because of like trying to balance the classes out? No, it was because the DM didn't know the spells well and didn't want wizards in the game. Really? Okay. Yeah. So he uh, pretty much curtailed all arcane magic on his world. He had some it was, we played our first session. I had a wizard mm -hmm. and he's at the end of the session. What we ended up doing was causing magic to stop working. Oh, so then at the end of the session, he said, well, um, anyone who's playing a wizard, you can't cast any spells Great. essentially. Oh, so, wow. uh, if That's you happen to find a magic item that has them in there, then mm -hmm. yeah. You can oh use that my. like a wand. You can right. use a wand, but otherwise you're pretty much screwed. No one would play a wizard who couldn't cast spells. That's their right. bread and butter. That's right. who they are. 
Right. That's wow. it would have been better if he had started off that way, but he wanted to surprise us. So used a lot of bad DM, I think, bad DM decisions. Sure, surprises like that can be cool like in a novel or in a movie. Right. But when you're all when you've spent the time to make a character yep. and then the DM says, Well, now you can't use that character. Right. You're like, Well, screw you too. I mean, right. it's, it's exactly. really, it's really it's bad. Cool. It's a, it's a it's dick very move. bad thing. Yeah. And I think I've probably done stuff like that before in the past. So, so I mean, it's a shame, but you should. Do I made a cleric, a halfling cleric, and it, he ended up being really tough. I was going to say, didn't you reach like almost 20 levels? Yeah, we played, I think we played all the way up to 20th level. How cool is that? And uh, because of the, this was third edition, not three, five, mm -hmm. um, the Holy Trinity, once we mm -hmm. got up to being able to use that, oh yeah. boy. Yeah, you were just a boss. Yeah. Do you think they're too good? If you, when I look at the cleric through all the editions, they seem at worst, at worst, they're a maybe second place character after the wizard, maybe? Maybe. Third edition, they were as good as the wizard. Yeah, yeah. If not better. For through many levels, they were better. Right. So um, you had three five in holy crap, and I thought in Pathfinder they were boss. I would say overall the clerics are really good. I think the idea of a fighting man who can still cast spells, fully in armor protection, not quite the fighter, but pretty good. I think he's a little too good. Probably. It it's kind of odd that a cleric can cast really powerful magic while in armor, mm -hmm. but a wizard if they put on leather armor can't cast screw. Yeah, it's weird. I think they're also a little too. The cleric strikes me. That's why I love the specialty priest and I like the domains. Clerics in general and first edition stuff were too generic for me. I mean, if you didn't add a lot of flavor as a player and as a GM to your world and to each god, if you just played clerics, you could play a super. I'm the heel guy. I'm the heel guy with the armor. I'm pretty good dude. I'm faithful. Praise some random deity. Right. Um, it's supposed to be generic, though. I mean, the whole game is generic. Yes, and I think maybe maybe it's up to you. Then maybe that's a good point, Joe. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just up to the DM and the players to make their world more their own. Right. A um, couple of big things I thought come up to connect to this. I had some clerics, some players tell me they didn't want to play a cleric because they didn't want to have to be religious, and they didn't want to follow some religion in the game, and not because they were atheists. They just they want to be, didn't like all the requirements on them. They didn't um, want to. They didn't want to misstep and then lose their cleric abilities. Yeah, and I've always wanted. I've always wanted. I always thought someone's a cleric. I don't like the generic cleric in a campaign. I don't like someone saying I'm just a cleric. I just worship some random god, and they might even name them. That's one of the problems I have with Thirteenth Age too. They have no gods at all, and I just maybe it's because I want a rich world where a cleric of Odin is different than a cleric of Bast is a different from a cleric from Loki. I mean, I want them to be. They should act different. There should be some differences. And even if it's just in rituals, but... Um, I, don't I don't think know. it's all that hard. There's no... Well, because they want their player... Players want their characters to be able to do whatever. Right. So any sort of restriction on what they're, they envision their character to be doing uh, will... And that might be the whole reason why a lot of people don't want to have clear, play a clear. Because... Yeah different religions have different restrictions and they even if it never never ever ever comes up because most of the time it's not going to yeah well you know and I, I think really it should be smaller things and but if you're good i mean it should be to get those kind of powers from the god you, there should be a price to pay and uh you know, this always brings the question of the paladin we talked about the paladin and cleric not being very well distinguished if you have a cleric do you even need a paladin if you have a paladin do you really need a cleric I really think that the game game design they should choose one. I agree. Because really they're doing the same things. Unless you take the cleric and you take their armor and weapons away. Yeah. And they're just a divine wizard in a, in essence. Right. They can have the turning and mm -hmm. all the other stuff, but if you take away their armor and their weapons and uh they just have maybe they just have simple weapons. Yeah. Um or some small selection, like the wizards have a small selection, and they they don't have any armor proficiencies. Then, and they could pick those up, but that doesn't mean that you can cast any spells in them. 
So right. I think there should be some they should, that would bring them on par with, especially in third edition, on par with wizards. Now in okay. old D and D, you may not want to do that because I don't right. even think they had paladins. No, they didn't. So you, that's fine. You just have to clear it and that and just leave them alone. They're He's fine. Like, Holy warrior blessed by the gods could do magic they, things and miracles. They have which, lot, far fewer spells than the wizard class. Which D and D version of the clerics your favorite and why? If you had to, pick um, you know, if I had to pick one, it might be the old D and D. Oh, really? So it might like the, be you know? because it had its niche, mm -hmm. and uh, there wasn't a paladin to kind of muddy the waters on yeah. what its role was. You just yeah. had the cleric, and it was probably more balanced because it, it had fewer spells in the wizard, yep. uh, or the magic user, and um, it had limitations on the weapons. Yep. So it wasn't quite, quite as good fighter, as the fighter, right? So it was better balance. It's, it's probably a, in some ways, better designed. Uh, like later on, they just threw the kitchen sink at it. And it's funny because even though I'm complaining about the power of the cleric, I think it's broken. I really like the specialty priest from second edition, even though, the, but I like the flavor more than all the extra bonuses. Right, right. I really thought it was cool that, you know, a cleric of Hanali, something or other, who is the halfling cleric of love, is very different than a cleric of Thor. And they got special powers to prove it, different weapons, different this, different that. They didn't all turn undead. Cler Druids didn't turn undead, though they were clerics of nature. Um, I thought, um, but I agree with you. I think the old D&D &D was simpler, had its own role to fill, and wasn't nearly as um, redundant as he became, and powerfully so. I mean, he went from being not quite the fighter, not quite the wizard, to being mm, all but the fighter and as good as the wizard and wearing armor. Right. Now, he wasn't really the fighter in pure melee until he got the Holy Trinity in third edition. But then, I mean, there are other ways, too, to become that kind of broken cleric. So, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about one variant. I suppose some fun variants of a cleric. One was, you know, forget the whole... Uh, wizard uh, cleric separation and just, I'd say, forget the cleric and use the paladin and let the wizards decide that you can have white wizards or wizards that heal or like in Savage Worlds, wizards that use, you know, the heal spell, which we have those in our game. Magic is magic. Magic is magic, yeah. Um, and then, remember, <laughs> I can't believe I did this in terms of balance, but in the late second edition stage, I became enamored of clerics calling the power that they needed at the time. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around why would a cleric prepare raise dead? Right. That just seemed dumb. Yeah. Seemed, and, and furthermore, why would the God give him the power of raising the dead that he could have upon a command? And so I'll, I'll let clerics pick their spells on the fly, which made them even more powerful, but I wouldn't let the wizards do it. Right. I thought it was too powerful. I think well, maybe, yeah. if you're going to do the on the fly like that, mm -hmm. I would say, especially if the cleric had all the fighting ability that it did, let's say third edition, let's say in third edition, you said, oh, yeah. I didn't do that in third. I did it in second. Right. Then, well, even in second, they had pretty good combat abilities. Yes, they did. I would say I would restrict the number of spells significantly. Yes. So, yeah, you can you can call down whatever you want, but you only get to do it a couple of times per spell yeah. level. Correct. Maybe something like that. Maybe even less than that. They may only get to cast a couple spells per day. Yeah. Period. So, but I like the idea of a, I would, now you could give a cleric like that a lay on hand ability of a paladin. Mm -hmm. Sure. And make sure. the paladin more like the Templar type champion. You know, and a professor dungeon master, his clerics are Templars and they have very strict rules on his clerics. So, what about other systems? I mentioned like our Savage Worlds game, 13th Age, the Oracle and Pathfinder was a nice kind of sorcerer cleric combo. Right. I, I think those you like better or worse. Hmm? Uh, I like the it? Oracle and Pathfinder, but it was like a lot of things in Pathfinder. It was probably too tough. Just like well, it, it was a big power up. Um, but I think the Oracle probably is a better. It's the it's the more it's like the wizardy cleric or yep. sorcery sorcerer. Didn't wear armor. Yeah. Didn't wear armor. Used sorcerer type rules and had some. Uh, interesting abilities. You could probably just dump the cleric with one of them. What about Thirteenth uh, Age? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Finish your thought. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. So Thirteenth Age, like I've already mentioned. Now they're like other. There's kind of a mix between Third and Fourth Edition. So you had powers and stuff. And I like the cleric, but I don't like their vagueness. They're just like 
the gods don't really care. The clerics don't get powers from the gods. They get their powers from their own beliefs and their focus, but they kind of don't even, they say, you don't even got to mention gods, which I personally don't like that. I like a mythology, I like a pantheon. I like all that in my world. If you're not That's going to mention gods, you probably shouldn't have clerics. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And What's plus, the point? Crazy. well, just, a, I don't know, you can, because you can heal yourself in 13th age and fourth edition with your with your surges or your recovery so they didn't seem necessary um savage worlds they just blend powers with powers they do have a in deadlands they have the blessed but i mean in a fantasy world we look at the fantasy companion I mean, they say you can restrict spells if you want but you can we're going wide open you know we got mm -hmm. three casters and our well four casters counting you in the group and one of them's pretty healy patrick's mm -hmm. wife and Patrick and Jeff are both wizardy dudes, and you're kind of the rangery dude. You, you picked a you kind of carefully, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not collected, but um, curated your spell list to make him kind of just a yeah. he buffs himself or other people. It's more of a rangery dude, but um, yeah, I picked the spells that I thought would help him out in in combat. So, so do you like that system of spells better or not? Where, where it's just power spells that you pick and magic's magic's magic. Oh, I prefer magic is magic. Mm -hmm. um, I I think as far as when you're talking about a generic system like D&D &D is, mm -hmm. it, it's probably better served to say magic is magic and then uh, give tools to the DM to craft their world the way they want. Yeah. Because really, if I just said, okay, do playing D&D, &D, there are no clerics. Wizards can cast any spell, even cleric spells. But if they got to prepare them and find them, I mean, just because I say you can doesn't make it any easier in getting more spells. Correct. And you got to still, and now you've got even harder choices. Man, do I want to take heal or do I want to take, you know, teleport? Right. Or do I want to take blade barrier? That's pretty boss. Or do I want to take, you know, another six level spell of some sort? So and then, then you get to have that same conversation with the players. Why didn't you, why didn't you select healing as a spell? I, said, <laughs> I would say, because everybody here can heal themselves already if you're playing a particular version like a uh, 13th well, age or whatever. Yeah, but if we're playing standard d and I think you could even do that. And that would make, and that would, the danger is it would make the magic user even more important because no one would want to do an adventure without a magic user unless you gave the paladin clerical type powers where he could lay on hands very strongly and he could maybe call down some divine wrath of some sort every but like very limited like once or twice a day he could have a spell like power that wouldn't be so bad if he made a certain role and god call but you know somehow doing it differently or just let him do it however you want to do it right. that can make him interesting but he wouldn't be but like man i'd like to have a wizard cast heal three times a day that'd be pretty sweet and be like yeah that's true so that but yeah that'd be one problem i think would be having the wizard become too important but I think he already is very important in every version of the game, so it may not matter. Right. <sighs> so, any final thoughts on the cleric? Um, I think we covered just about all my thoughts. Uh, what about discussing here at the end the idea of... I'm sorry, were you thinking of something else? I was trying. Go ahead. I was going to say, what about the idea of the, the position or role of healer? Would you prefer it be spread out like in a 13th age system where several classes can do some cool heal stuff? You can do your own cool heal stuff. Like, you know, I've always thought I wondered if a resurgence mechanic where a fighter could, you know, re-fortify himself after a short rest and not defined by fifth edition, just the short rest in general terms and get a few hit points back. I kind of like that ability for certain characters, but I don't think I want it to be all the time. It probably will depend on the tone of the game. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing old school gritty type um, gameplay, that probably no. won't work very well. No. But uh, if you're doing like standard fantasy fair, you know, where you know, it's just regular D and D, I think that could work. Uh, also, I think something that could something that could uh, help out. See, healing is an issue with D and D because you have, excuse me. Healing is an issue in D&D because you have a lot of hit points. Yes. And you're constantly needing to get those hit points back. Right. So one way to do it is to have better access to healing potions. Gotcha. So 
um, or some mundane way to heal, like herbs and whatnot. Right. That's yeah. significant. So, uh, so that anybody with the appropriate background or skill, depending on how you do that in your game, could have some um, herbs or ointments on hand or a magical potion that's not too expensive. Or you could just say healing potions as they're presented aren't necessarily magical. Right. They're just a, an herbal concoction that you can buy and make them not that expensive. They'll be more, they'll be more, they'll be expensive enough that the common person couldn't have a bunch of them. But adventurers who are typically a little more well yeah. off than your standard uh, D and D uh, average guy on the uh, guy in the village, you're mm -hmm. gonna have more more resources at hand and can probably pick them up or have somebody in the party that might know how to put one together. It's got some alchemy or some herbalism or is a rangery dude or a druidy mm -hmm. dude that knows woods, you know, know so, the best berries and the best sort of can make the pace that would heal you or whatever. Yeah, that would be all right. Yeah. So at low levels, you could have you could still have that be a role that a person has that so you don't lose the teamwork aspect mm -hmm. um but um for the low level game you can have uh that not necessarily be um dependent on the cleric or dependent on magic to resolve yeah and at high level you want to make the healing potions and stuff weak enough to where high level characters aren't like i can buy five thousand of them yeah but they heal a d8 at a time right an action for a D8 hit points. You're really going to waste your time when you need 40? No. Right. Give right, right. me a heal spell. Do something cool. You know? Right. Yeah. True. All right. Anything else you want to talk about with healing or clerics? I don't think so. All right. I think it's it. clerics are an interesting, powerful class that few people want to play. It's weird. I agree with you. I think I think it's got... Uh, I think traditionally... I now, these days, maybe not, because the okay. whole restrictions on your actions for your DD a, isn't there. So, yeah, if you're talking about 5e, not so much. Right. I think back in the day, the heel bot issue, the religious restrictions kind of held a lot of people back. Yeah. And now I don't know so much that's the case. At least in our, in our neck of the woods, they seem to hold people back. So Right. Maybe others out there would have a comment. So Right. All right. Shall we move on to a little... This is going to be a little cabin con moment, because I only have one comment. Sure. <laughs> was asking you in cabin con here as we transition how long till you start thinking about cabin con 16 with gusto i mean we mentioned how fun and we're excited and love to go back but when you really dig in and say hey i need to start preparing it for me i have an answer from a dm's perspective do you have an answer from players slash dm perspective it comes and goes throughout the year mm -hmm. so okay so when you think about it you're like oh this would be cool to do mm -hmm. and then you might jot some notes down and then mm -hmm. you have to deal with life. And yeah. then uh, a couple months later, oh, this would be cool too. So it comes and goes. So yeah. probably for me, January-ish. Yeah, January, February, I'm like getting serious. Yeah. I'm thinking after the holidays, I'm like, I got to start thinking about it. And usually by the end of February, I'm like, I did sooner than that this year. I got to write some stuff down. I got to start plan on what adventures precisely i got to make decisions i'm how many you know my two games are going to become four because you know that's how i do i try to do two but i always do four or more and uh let me decide which ones i'm going to do yeah i think that's the case so cabin con 16 right now i'm like you i just jot notes in random places it seems like though i have a cabin con folder somewhere and then come around january february randy's getting serious i'm going to prep this game then i'm going to prep that game then i'm going to prep this game Right. And usually I'm working until about two weeks before Cabin Con. I try, I've try. i been trying to get done about two weeks before Cabin Con in the last few years, and I've succeeded that way. All right. Yeah. All right, so just a short comment on Cabin Con. Now, we're going to try out a new segment today, and I would love people to comment if they find this interesting. I title it, at least right now, Like It, Love It, or Leave It. And I want to get it as a – this is a chance for me and Joe to work off the cuff he has thought of three questions to ask me, and I've thought of three questions to ask him. Uh, mine are more statements, and I want to get his opinion on it, whether he likes it, loves it, or leaves it. Um, and this might spark more conversation. It should be more about being geeks, but it might be something outside of geekery. I, I won't promise we won't do anything political or religious to throw people off, but it won't be on purpose trying to be – I'm not going to try to be particularly 
provocative in these is just to get to know Joe better and Joe and you guys get to know me better. Um, so would you like to go first or maybe we'll go you back? You go first. Go first. All right. Mine are coming at you with one word. One okay. word questions. Okay. Okay. The first one is anime. Um let's see. I'd have to uh, in these, uh, I'd lean heavily to leave it, but some of it I like. Okay. But you believe um, in it? So one that I like have liked anime wise is Bleach. Hmm. Okay. Never seen that one. And uh Bleach is uh a long running. I don't know if it's stopped. It has lots of episodes. Oh really? Okay. Um it's about uh fish out of water initially. Uh kind of situation where you have a, a teenager uh, who's kind of selected to become a um, the way that, a substitute uh, in the in the uh, mythos of this world of this anime uh, is called a soul reaper hmm. and it sounds kind of bad but what they do is they defeat these um, creatures who devour souls and they assist wandering spirits to where they're supposed to go. That, um, that's, inter that's interesting. Does, is it something that's uh, there's something you'd have to, can you watch it on one of the streaming services or something you got to like buy? Um, so, it's you know, on Hulu. Oh, okay. And it's been around a long time. Yeah, there's uh, hundreds of episodes. Wow. I isn't your wife a big fan of anime? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember uh, my, the first anime I watched was Ron, oh, not Ranma, was um, what's the one ever back in the day everybody talked about it? Record Akira. of the World. No, Akira. 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 Oh, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So Akira, I tried to like it, but it was a confused mess of different things happening. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I didn't, it's an anime works a particular way. Mm -hmm. It's a particular type of storytelling yep. and presentation that is sometimes, and it's, it covers a lot of ground. There's different types of anime and yep. some of them, it's like the, the anime where when people are getting ready to battle, yep. it takes 10 minutes of running at each other to accomplish <laughs> uh, or, and, and Bleach has this too. It's very, very serious. And all of a sudden, some zany thing happens and totally ruins the mood, but it's the way anime works. So yeah, when I'm like, what do they do that for? My wife is like, it's anime. It's supposed to do that. You mentioned all the things that, and it's about Joe, but I'm going to make a comment on my side. I, I would absolutely leave it in the garbage. And we got a lot of friends that like it. I just can't, I watch I, Joe's recommended record of Lotus war. I tried to watch about 10 minutes. I'm probably, here's the thing. I'm scarred by two animes, Akira, which I was pushed in college to watch. And I'm sorry, it was dog poop. Mm. Then I watched Fist of the North Star as a second recommendation. And that's where your thing came in and the guy's like, we're going to fight. I'm going to fight you. And then, bro, he's flying through the air with his fist out for a half hour. Then they switched to the other guy. He's flying through his fist for that, through the air with his fist for a half hour. And it was just me and Darren, <laughs> Big D, watched it. And uh, I, I was doing a little mst3k when it came i forgot about 20 minutes in because i hated it dude rips his shirt off and the character has no nipples and i and i dubbed it myself i said i'm the nippleless warrior none yeah. can defeat me <laughs> and we just started dying i was like i just hate i don't hate it really like i used to i just don't i think i just don't get it but uh, i know you've, you've didn't you watch something about um there's a real sad one that came out a few years ago that everybody loved it was critically acclaimed i know there's house haunting Haunted Castle, Walking Castle. But then there's another one that was, I, mean, I know Patrick and his wife, I think Jeffrey watched it. It was like really sad, kind of a World War, a wartime thing. That oh, yeah. A butter, the butterfly one. Yeah. It's supposed yeah. to be like really, you want to use Japanese for you, right? I mean, they're, it's, they're usually pretty big on tragedy. So it's very tragic. Okay. And I had no idea what it was. So and you would say you like some, but it's, you're pretty picky with it then. It's very picky. If it gets too zany mm -hmm. or too, they can get really close, like um, Black Butler. Yeah. It is extremely edgy toward pedophilia. 
oh dude no thank you i know i know they have like something called tentacle porn it's like uh. but, i mean even the regular that's, that's hentai to be fair i've watched ranma one half an episode at gen con and it kind of made me chuckle yeah but, it's supposed yeah, to be funny and vampire hunter d was okay and that's yeah. my that's the best i can say for anime right <laughs> uh, i'll tell you like a lot of things vampire hunter d is gr- is pretty cool to read but not but so good to watch. not so good to watch gotcha yeah it's okay okay all right so yeah keep going okay so uh second for joe star trek star trek star trek i like it yeah okay. uh, i'm not i'm not a cosplay fanboy type of person mm-hmm. right uh sometimes i'll be interested in getting a thing that's star wars like but it soon passes. I, mean, Star I love Trek. watching it and talking Star about Trek. the Star lore. Trek. You said Star Trek means Star Trek, like right? Yeah, Star Trek. Either okay. yeah, Star Trek. Star Trek. Yeah. Um, so you you like watching it and talking about the lore? The lore. Sure. But tell me this. Can I ask you interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Would you, if there was a convention near our city and we had a Saturday off and said, "Hey Joe, it's a Star Trek convention. You want to go check it out?" And you had. If the I had out. nothing else to do, yeah, I'm not big on conventions, so no, that's a no, different. I'm just saying. But you wouldn't be. But you'd be like. If you had the time and the money, it was no big deal. You're like, that sounds all right. Let's go do it. Been, yeah, okay. Afternoon to at least explore. Yeah. Okay. Especially if the uh, emission fees are low. Yeah, right. Because it can get expensive, sure. Right, right, right. But you like it. You wouldn't call it love, but you like it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I could call it love, but with parameters. I love right. watching it, and yeah. I love talking about the lore, but that's okay. about it. Gotcha. Oh, play! Okay. I would play a game oh, based okay. in based in Star Wars, like in Star Trek, or Star Trek. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, because th- that's something. There's a game, Star Trek Adventures, that's out now. A new one. There's been a couple of role playing games. I always wondered if that would go well. All right. Ready for the last one? Go ahead. Gonna shoot your curveball. Gardening. Gardening is interesting. Um, okay. We have a vegetable garden in our backyard. I thought so. And. Uh, I like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I would like to have more than a small plot to work with. So uh, yeah, uh, we got a small plot, so we have to make really precise decisions on what we're going to plant. I like the results a lot yeah. more than the work. Ood. Yes. What um, about? Did you want enough land where you had? Now, do you do you have a tiller? I do, but uh, I haven't used it in a while. Okay. Would you want enough land where you had to use a gas-powered tiller? And had, I mean, oh, you had like a big plot of land where you had to farm, really do like serious gardening. I mean, granted, I mean, say you I had. I think the uh, most I would want to have half is, an acre. Is that too much? Quarter acre. Oh, I think I'd rather have something more along the lines of one to three acres of total property. Mm-hmm. But for but I acre. still, there's ways you can do gardening and not till. Oh, okay. You I didn't know. till once. Mm-hmm. And then if you prepare the, the ground right, you wouldn't have to till it again. The problem oh. with tilling it all the time is um, over time you develop uh, an ecosystem within the soil. So there's little critters oh. and stuff. And every time you till it, you screw that up. Oh, okay. 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 Gotcha. And, yeah, critters so for good, big, big critters that do good thing for the plants. Right. So, yeah. and the big farm operations where they till up the ground every year and everything and do the monocropping mm-hmm. is is really not great for the soil. It causes a lot of erosion and stuff. So don't they have to do a lot of ro- crop rotation so that it works out well? Yeah, alive? but they don't do it. Oh, that's well, not great. Yeah, the gigantic operations they they use their entire crop land. I don't think they that, that uh, for most of those guys, rotating isn't a thing. They just throw down um, fertilizers and use a lot of chemicals and stuff. Gotcha. And, and yeah. But I was more like personal gardening because I'm thinking about getting more into it. Do you like, uh, so you, so you like it? Overall, I like it. But you, you love the, you love what you get. You love the food. I love the food. I love you the, not, and I don't, not just the food, the idea that I, I'm, um, stepping away from the, um, uh, modern, um, food industry. Yeah. So, 
the more I can disengage from all that stuff, I think is better because you get yeah, better Deb, food. You get better yeah, food out of it. Do. Deb and I just bought, I had a guy, he's making us a 10, uh, five gallon, but it holds five gallon buckets, wooden frame for mm -hmm. a freestanding, basically garden that we can put stuff in these container garden, container garden. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of excited about that. We're going to get cool. that. So I can't wait. All right. You want to shoot some at me, bud? Yes. Right. Westerns westerns i love them <laughs> and only recently in my life could i say that early on in my life i remember my grandfather and some uncles would watch those and be like i'm so bored mm -hmm. can't we watch a scary movie can't we watch star wars or well, actually back then it wasn't star wars but couldn't we watch rap pro when i was young couldn't we watch wrestling? wrestling you know but uh i used to love that but like it was like but westerns man uh, and, and spaghetti westerns i mean tombstone turned the year Tombstone, Tombstone came out, I turned my eye toward Westerns and I got into Deadlands and now I love it. I bought especially Clint Eastwood Westerns, the spaghetti Westerns, the good, the bad, and the ugly and all those. Have you that seen trailer. Silverado yet? I have not. It's on my list. I need to watch. You told me about that. I got to watch Silverado. That's supposed to be a really good one. Um, I just love the whole genre and I love, I love, I don't mind the formula because I like when the good guys win and you get a lot of that in a lot of the Westerns. Right, right. It's yeah, kind of a hero journey type show, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but yeah, I like. Sometimes watch. there's some tragedy though. Sometimes yeah. the hero beats the bad guy, but he dies anyway. Yeah. So th th to me, they're just really cool. In fact, well, that's just a know. variation. It's a yeah. variation. Sacrifice yourself. Yeah. I definitely like westerns. I yes. love westerns. Love yeah. them. Yeah. Gen Con. <laughs> that one. Oh, had you asked me this ten years ago. It would have been love because, you know, for about I've been to about 20 of those things mm -hmm. and I was way into it. Now it's simply too big and I don't care about the COVID stuff. It's just too big. Um, I don't feel I don't feel like I belong there. Um, I don't fit the mold of a lot of the a lot of the gamers. There, there's definitely an old school um, uh, contingent. And I don't mean like old school gaming, just older people. It's too much money. So I'm kind of at the like it a little, kind of like how you feel about anime, but more leave it. Um, yeah, we had a completely different answer 10 years ago. But Gen Con is just, I don't know, it's too much, um, a lot of flesh too, a lot of super sexy cosplay. Um, don't need those images in my head. Uh, struggle enough with that. Um, yeah, Gen Con is not, uh, yeah, it's, it's real close to the leave it. Though I have to admit, with the COVID thing and them cutting down to 35K this year, I was partially, tempted is not the word, but intrigued to go because I would love to be an indie with only 35,000 Gen Con attendees. That would probably be a totally different animal. Oh, it would be probably just fabulous um, if you had the same space. Um, but I think we're requiring, you know, mask everywhere you go and all that stuff. So, which is kind of silly because I don't think Indiana requires, Indiana, just, last time I was in Indiana a month ago and they don't require a mask at all, anywhere at all. So um, it's it's a uh, tricky territory to. Uh, they probably I don't know what their policy was with vaccinations, mm -hmm. but um, it would have been a tricky policy had they. I'm not sure if they did or not. Uh, said if you have your vaccine, you don't have to have a mask, and then right. have some sort of proof to bring. Well, they would they would, and they would incur some sort of liability. I wonder, I know that Alex Cameron, I heard this on a pod, I think it was on uh, Tinkar, some of you listened to their, his interview with Alex Cameron from Gamehole Con. They're about 3K people. They, they're requiring vaccines to go now. And um, while I don't agree with Alex for doing that, I'm fine with him saying it. It's his, his convention and he's requiring it. And, um, and they're not having masks. If you're, if you're, you go, you don't have to wear a mask because they're going to be vaccinated so i don't know the um, number of yeah, people yeah. who've gotten covid after getting a vaccine is kind of high so it's kind of a silly requirement is it really yeah. <laughs> okay well off that but gen con yeah, yeah it's mostly legal um dvds as in collecting yeah. them <laughs> like it used to love it i have quite a few um, I, 
I know you can stream everything. You got Netflix. You can watch all these movies and Prime. And if you pieced all the streaming devices that I can get access to in the streaming programs, I wouldn't need a DVD ever. I bought much less in the last five or six years. But if I got a cool Lord of the Rings, I bought the special edition. I don't regret it. I would absolutely want to have the DVD. I don't want just to watch it on Netflix or whatever. Um, the superhero stuff, I'm losing my interest in. But DVDs, I would say I like. I still like a physical DVD. Um, applies to Blu-ray too, obviously. Okay, so you were talking about DVDs. Yeah, and so basically for me, DVDs are something I can't let go of the physical, just like I couldn't with music CDs for a long time. Things I really like, I want to have a copy of. I was buying lots of movies for a while. I got probably two, three dozen movies I wish I'd never bought, but um, right now I still like them. I tend to don't watch them very much. I tend to do more streaming, but, um, you know, or, or watch, you know, Netflix, or I guess Netflix is streaming. But yeah, I like them. Used to love them. Used to love them. Right. It's uh for for now it's kind of a toss up between space and whether or not I'm gonna rewatch the movie. Right. Right. Lord of the Rings, I know I will. I watch it every year. So and I like to watch my extended Mulan edition, you know, subtitles and all that good stuff. So where you need a whole week to watch it. <laughs> Pretty much because you it's like eleven and a half hours long. Right. But it's worth every minute, it really is. So anyway, I think we're done with that. I was yeah. like it if folks would call in and tell me if they think this is a useful thing, if they would like to hear more about us and something different. So anyway, so uh, I think it's time to wrap things up, bud, because we don't have a negative plane because we're like in good mood. Good mood. All good. Although you tried to get me into the negative material plane earlier. Oh, I know. I pushed you a little bit. Push me. Walked you to the edge. Anyway, if you'd like to support our show, please uh, help with the word out. Check out our podcast or our website, www.biggestgeekestpodcast.com. If you feel like hitting the support button, throwing us a few, few dollars, that'd be cool. If not, just spread it around to your friends. Let them know that we're in here and we smell good. Um, check us out on YouTube as well. Rate us on iTunes or other podcatchers. And um, Odyssey. Oh, Odyssey now. Yeah, dude. Odyssey, alternative for you uh, decentralized folks out there, which we all should try to be. Um, one of our friends uh, gave us a, a like on the Spotify. He said, apparently you can oh, find the podcast. Um, our emails are still the same, or did you change it, Joe? I did. Do you know what it is? Um, the Geeks. Oh, the Geeks at Biggest at, Geek? Yeah. Is it lowercase? Everything's lower, lowercase. Okay, it's, the new... The new um, Email is thegeeks at biggestgeekestpodcast.com. Send us any questions or comments, especially about what you thought about the latest ep the latest episode and our new segment. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, we'd like to encourage you to check out a few podcasts we have listed down at the bottom. One is also a blog, Clear to Our Ring Mail. Mr. Taylor called in today. I'm really liking that. You need to read that, Joe. There's a lot of good stuff on there. I have read some. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right. Well, it was a good time tonight, bud. Yes, it was. This is Randy. And I'm Joe. Remember, can't be big like us and be geeks like us. <laughs>